the pretty damn obvious conclusion in hindsight that almost all of the world's problems stem from the fear of death. And that if we can eliminate that fear, then everyone's lives would be so much better. Not, not easier, not harder, not longer, not more luxurious or less luxurious, but better. Fear of your own mortality, or even just fear in general, like being unable to accept death, unable to cope with the realization that one day you will go to sleep and never wake up again. Like the inability to reconcile the two ideas that your life needs to be meaningful and at the same time, eventually so much time will pass that the last person who will ever remember you will die and that your life inevitably will have no meaning. Like, it's it's what people do in response to the inability to reconcile these two thoughts, which is what ruins things for themselves and others. First of all, this whole stream is just a giant flex for me. Let me, let me get this straight, okay? I know my archetypes, okay? I know my stories. And the story of death is, is, a, is an interesting one. Death is actually a friend. And it's a friend that you don't want at first, naturally, um, because you want to continue to play the games uh, as a little kid when you f first find out about your own mortality. You are scared of a day coming where you don't get the option to play the games that you love so much. So it's only natural that you would be scared of it, but it is a friend nonetheless. And he will kill you, but you can't blame him for that. It's just a part of who he is. It's much better to befriend death. And when your time comes, you walk with him together as brothers in your passing. Because your only other option is to struggle in futility and then die. You don't get the option to live. So take your pick. You either go disgracefully or you go gracefully. Like Gold Roger. And potentially Luffy. Or, yeah, I mean, definitely Luffy when he dies, but... In reality, death is not the enemy in any of these stories. But it's the people who try to defy death, who try to cheat death, who run away from death. Those are the actual enemies. Also, death isn't inherently bad. There's nothing evil about death. There's nothing um, tragic that, it, that underlying, underlyingly tragic about death. It hurts a lot, yeah, when a family member dies, friends die, all that stuff. Uh, you know, your dog dies, whatever. You're going to cry. Don't get it fucked up. It's going to hurt, but that pain is a part of life and a necessary one at that. Anyone who's seen inside out by now should realize that sadness is not a bad emotion. It's just as essential as all the others. You shouldn't try to ignore it. There's nothing going on in life where people die that's unjust. Now, if someone dies when it's not yet their time, then yeah, it can be considered a tragedy. Children slitting their wrists, teenagers shooting each other in the streets, adults getting hit by a drunk teenage driver. Like, these are all tragic. Um, but dying of disease? I mean, that's a part of the contract you sign when you join planet Earth. Sometimes nature will just strike you down. It's random. But it's fair. It's sad, for sure. and But you'll you'll get over it. And sometimes you won't, but that's life. Grieving for like five to ten years is actually a surprisingly short amount of time to grieve someone close to you dying in the grand scheme of things. See, in life, you'll be at a major crossroads in certain moments. Um, only a handful for most people. And in these moments, you'll be given two options. Love or fear. This is the core the, the binary decision-making of our morals. Where do you lean? More towards love or more towards fear? And wherever you lean, people who lean in the opposite direction are seen as the enemy. To me, fear is pretty much always the wrong choice. I pretty much always... Um, like... Mm, I, I shouldn't say always... Because there is a possibility that there, 
that I would consider it the right choice in, in a circumstance. However, I've yet to find an example where fear is actually the correct choice. I've yet to see one. But it's, it's usually the more tempting choice, that's for sure. And it's driven by this need for safety. It's hard to explain exactly, so I'll give you an example. So, back when me and this dude were first looking to um, live in a content house, right? We wanted to start a content house. Every time we'd find a viable option, he'd be like, Oh no, this is this area is dangerous. Oh no, this is too close to the hood. Oh no, this is where uh, the frats of this college are. Oh, it's unsafe here. Like, he would always have some sort of excuse. Oh, this is where... Uh, there's also apartments for students. You know, they come back um, drunk and stoned and off pills and stuff like that. It's not safe. And that's the thing. Like, I was down for any of them. Yeah, it's unsafe. And it's scary to me, too. I know the risks. But I love the prospect of a content house so much. I love this adventure so much that the love outweighs the fear. Like, I love creating this content right now that I'm making right now that it outweighs the fear of like people finding out about this and, and clowning on me for the things I'm saying. We were also debating um, having his friend live with us in, in this house. And the guy was on the fence because his friend was super unmotivated. I don't want to go into any specifics, but he just wasn't all that motivated at the time. And we just felt like it would be a better environment if everyone there was hyper-focused on making a career out of this, like content creation. But eventually, we decided it's better for his friend to be a part of it. In reality, that was actually always going to happen, but in our heads, there was this debate. But ultimately, we have a responsibility to push him to be better if he's a friend, and he has a responsibility to push us to be better wherever we're lacking. You have to love your bros more than the idea of having to deal with awkward situations. So love wins. But that's a, that's a personal example. Here's, here's one everyone can relate to, okay? Here's one everyone can understand. The political example. Let's take someone like Michelle Obama, okay? She fucked up the school lunches back when I was in middle school. She did not know shit. She removed Coke from the vending machines, but she left Diet Coke, which is so fucking stupid because Diet Coke is way, way worse than Coke for your health. But, like, she's not smart. She just looks at the labels and goes, uh, Diet Coke must be healthier because it says diet. In reality, she never should have been given permission to make decisions that affect children across the nation. Her own children are out here, like, sneaking away from Secret Service to go smoke and drink and get pregnant and stuff. Like, you worrying about the wrong kids, Michelle. Now, she had a decision. She could have picked fear or love. What? Where does the fear come from? Okay, let, let's, let's look at the pros and cons. Well, she wants a good image, right? If she makes generic legislation like that, that is uncontroversial in the eyes of the idiotic um, executives and and masses who don't bother to think about this sort of thing, as long as it sounds good, she'll get political brownie points. Who cares if it affects other people? Why love other people? She's so afraid of not having these political brownie points that, well, to be honest, I'll give her some credit. Everybody wants that. It's, reason, it's a reasonable fear to have. To, to have the whole world hate you, like that's a totally reasonable... My question is, where's the love at? You could have shown some love for the students. Oh, wait, it's Michelle Obama we're talking about. If she had loved the students, she would have said, well, maybe I should do more research on this and ask some actual dietary experts before I tamper with the nutrition of future generations of America. Or better yet, she could have said, I'm not qualified to make a decision like this. I'm going to leave this up to people smarter than me. But she has no love for the American children. So naturally, a fear outweighed the love. What about an example where love outweighed fear. Well, those are the heroes. Like, this is literally what separates villains and heroes in the real world. Take Edward Snowden, for example. He's the first one that comes to mind. A lot of people knew about the secrets of the NSA. They knew that the CIA was equivalent to a terrorist organization. They knew 
that the NSA employs black hat hackers to find exploits in industry-leading software so the government can spy on people. This is not a conspiracy theory anymore. This shit gets exposed over and over again in a near daily basis. Like literally recently, like a couple weeks ago, I think, a bunch of kids got a bunch of personal information about people who owned iPhones just from contacting Apple saying that they were the FBI. Like that they just told that they were the FBI, which shows that Apple is literally giving information to the FBI. This corruption is real. And what happens if you blow the whistle? Well, you're probably dead. It's, it's been shown repeatedly. You don't take care of yourself, you're probably, you, you end up dying very, very shortly afterwards. There's a lot to fear. There's a lot more on your line than just your reputation, like with Michelle Obama. You stand to lose everything. You stand to lose your life and your family. But Edward Snowden loved the American population and just people in general more than he feared being targeted and killed by the most ruthless and kill-happy organization on the planet. That's badass. That's, that's a hero. That's why we admire the guy. I personally, I love comedy more than I fear getting canceled. Earlier, um, last stream, I was talking about how people say Miskiff changed. This is how. This is, well, this is one of the ways. Miskiff has more money now than he knows what to do with. But nowadays, he seems more scared than ever to, to risk any of that. He doesn't take the risks like he used to. He has such a giant budget and he's so financially secure. So I can't imagine that he'd be more scared now, right? So the audience is left to conclude on their own, without even realizing it subconsciously, the audience infers that Mizkiff loves his audience less and less. To the point where now it seems like everything he does is just to get those viewer numbers up and just to cash out on that bounty. And Maya was always like this. Like, there was no... You, you would hear Maya occasionally let things slip. Um, it's just a shame that Miskiff let Maya change him so much. Go back and watch the old Maya videos. She literally... Like, she cares a bit about Twitch. Not that much, though. She just spams bounties. Like, she literally would talk about occasionally... When she's not even paying attention, she would be like, Oh, I don't know how long this, like thing is going to last, so I might as well milk it for every dollar I can possibly do, right? Maya is more driven by her fear of being financially unstable more than the love for the adventure of streaming. When I found out that people like Ludwig cared less about the, the daring adventure of streaming more than they did about the prospect of the attention they'd get, the notoriety they'd get, the money they'd get, I, I just, I can't watch them anymore. It's so disingenuous. Miskiff doesn't seem like this kind of person. Well, at least not, he didn't used to. Um, in fact, I can go more in depth on my um, Gonkutsuo anime review, uh, which I plan on doing very shortly. But in, in short, you will choose fear one of two reasons in these pivotal decisions. Either you feel a whole lot of fear or you feel very little love. People who feel a whole lot of fear are incompetent. People who feel very little love are malicious. And people who are both are called social justice warriors. But that's a topic for a different day. And Stoics are people who are competent, they're strong, who also choose love regardless of how much fear they feel. Stoics love the world so much that no, no amount of fear could ever overpower that. But the people who pick fear, most of the time, their motivation comes from their decision to be afraid of death. And that's why, you know, so many, uh, so many moms nowadays take millions of like selfies, post them up on Facebook to be public because they care less about loving the present and loving the adventure of their life and, and more about letting their image survive beyond their death into eternity um, in, in this fear that they'll, they'll miss the future. They learn nothing from Master Uguay. It's, it's 
fear that drives people to take these photos. It's flexing, it's posing and shit. It's 90% of people, 99% of people actually, um, who do things like, like post all these different pictures to Instagram, useless pictures for the sake of themselves and nothing else, not for a cause or anything. I, I like to think that the kind of person who loves way more than they fear in general, like someone who is willing to die for what they believe in, like they're the people who are truly uh, worthy of of having that that fear taken away, of having that notoriety, of having that um, immortalization. I've loved making YouTube videos so much. I was, I wasn't afraid. I was afraid, but compared to how much I love making YouTube videos, I wasn't afraid of losing everything, of you know, going homeless, of just so I can keep pursuing YouTube and never do anything else. My love for YouTube transcended my fear for everything that I could have ever experienced. MMA fighters command respect simply by stepping in the cage, because win or lose, they show love. By stepping into a locked cage with a wild animal, essentially, they're showing their love for the sport. They, they love the game so much that the fear of a, of a impending, brutally violent death doesn't determine them from confidently walking in the cage and dancing around on the canvas like it's their home, like they own the place. Jake Paul, for example, he fears not being talked about and not being the center of attention so much that he's willing to make the whole world hate him just to earn more money and get more clout. He sacrifices making honest content for, for his actual fans just for just for his fear of uh he doesn't want to be clowned on and that outweighs his love to make good content he probably does have love to make good content these guys have been making content for a long time but yeah his love for making good content is nowhere near his fear of um being irrelevant and what does that result in he's the villain he's the villain of youtube this dude gets ratioed daily. It's a regular occurrence for him. Because there's nothing manly about a guy who's too much of a pussy to make content he actually likes to make. But instead of instead of like shovel, shoveling family-friendly bullshit content to like a little ass kid audience to make constant ad money to make more money, at a certain point, a real one would stop and go like, all right, I've got enough money. Time to change the world. You know, maybe become a fucking legend. Time to make good content for once. Jake Paul has never once thought to himself, oh, I love making YouTube content more than I fear the slightly less income that I'll get by not exploiting kids for even more money than I already have. You know, I love making content more than I fear having $9 million a month rather than $10 million a month. Like, that, that's never, that thought has never occurred in his head. All the heroes of the world all love more than they fear. In Ratatouille, when Remy's dad was showing him um, how humans kill rats, that didn't stop him from pursuing cooking because he loved cooking more than he feared death. In Airbender, when May stop the guards from cutting down the gondola that would have killed Zuko. Um, Azula, the, you know, this monster, this cold-blooded prodigy, stood in front of her and threatened her. And May, a non-bender, just responds with, you miscalculated. I love Zuko more than I fear you. What a line, dude. What a line. It's actually a common theme in Airbender. Zuko, in the end, loved his uncle and his teachings more than he feared his father, especially on the day of the Black Sun, which is why he didn't hesitate to pull swords out on him um, just to tell him that he's going to help the Avatar beat him. I love 
the American people more than I fear the American government, which is why I support people's rights to defend themselves with firearms. I love people's individual personal beliefs and their, their freedom to not be forced to live according to someone else's morals more than I fear the dangerous consequences that come with people having dangerous beliefs. So I support people's freedom of speech and, and a, a press and assembly and religion. I support almost everything. I support the right to uh, get abortions and all that. I would never recommend it. I know two total people um, who have gotten abortions and they both deeply regret it. And they both live in shame even after so many years. Um, if you get an abortion, I will probably never talk to you again. Um, I don't think I ever could speak to you again. Because I love um, nature and humanity a lot more than I fear the burden of raising a child that was meant to be raised. Um, but in the end, I will fight for your right to have an abortion because I love personal freedoms so much more than, um, than I fear my own personal will not being uh, enacted upon the rest of the world and the rest of the population who are not like me. So, yeah. That, I think that was a bit complicated what I said, but I think, play it back, it, it'll make sense. I love nature and wildlife more than I fear living in a world where you can't control every centimeter of your surroundings, which is why I push for more areas in the United States to be turned into freer areas, more national parks and stuff, less licenses to do things, rather than places being transformed into commercial money-making machines. I, I push for more um, allowing for nature to manifest itself in, in reality and in, in human civilization. I love the art form of cars more than I fear carbon emissions. So I'm going to keep driving Subies and Mustangs. I love the environment more than I fear not having Amazon one day delivery. So I don't pay for any of that garbage. I don't support the usage of, um, you know, these insanely, uh, like, oil and coal-powered cargo ships that, like, don't give a fuck about, about the environment. I don't support fast fashion. I don't support these trends that absolutely destroy the environment, that do nothing but send humans down this, this um, addictive path of attention-seeking. I love making film more than I fear the embarrassment of failure. So I, it doesn't matter if I think making a video risks me getting clowned on. I'm still going to release it, and I'm going to keep making more. So you guys get the point. Um, I try my best to be a hero of the world, you know, a good guy. Uh, even though I still fear a lot, um, and in a lot of instances the fear outweighs the love, I, I, I try my best. So, I believe that most decisions where fear is picked, in, in humans in general, it's because of the fear of death. That's where it stems from. It's this fear of death that makes people want to carry a gun. It's Even though carrying a gun on a logical level does nothing to actually increase your chances of survival, um, but, you know... Saving yourself by shooting your enemy, that, that's not actually in saving your life. That's just delaying your death. And people are, are tempted to chase the feeling of like knowing that they could be responsible for the mortality of someone else because it eases the pain of knowing that your own mortality is actually out of your own control. It brings back that feeling of control. And that's, that's the medicine to treat the fear of death, but it's not the cure. What is the cure for this fear? I don't know. I watched my friends become drug addicts, and then I uh, fell off a trampoline and shattered my left wrist, and then I learned how to drive, and then I watched Whiplash, and I don't know, somewhere along these lines, I just stopped being afraid of death. I don't know what I did. I'm just not afraid of it anymore. 
I think it might have been around the time of like my 15th birthday or something like that. I don't know exactly how it happened, but maybe some of these, um, some of these factors played into it. Probably not though. Just random events that I thought stuck out when thinking about it, which could actually have a much more significant unconscious role. But after, you know, around the time I was like 15, 16, death didn't feel like a tragedy anymore. You guys want to know what a real tragedy is? Here, let, let, let's, I actually, in this particular topic, I have a bunch, I have a bunch of videos um, in my bookmarks on Chrome. Um, I'm going to open it up actually in, oh yeah, so, so look at this, look at this, look at this. You know what, remember what I was saying earlier about Carl Sagan describing the fourth dimension and how he takes, how the apple takes this like three dimensional creature and pulls him into the fourth dimension. Look at this. We live in a two dimensional world, up, down, left, and right. But what about forward and backward? What is that? What the fuck did he say? See, it's some shit you can't comprehend. He got the yeet ability, right? He literally yeets bitches backwards off of this plane of existence. <laughs> so they're not dead. Oh, damn. That's some animation. I ain't even know that Bullshit. shit. Bullshit. <laughs> this dude broke every wall imaginable. <laughs> You're just yeeting motherfuckers to another dimension and don't even know how. Some bullshit. With this new information, I believe this case can be dismissed. My client can be acquitted since there was no actual murder. Nah, regardless, he's still on some fuckery. All right then, Ace Phoenix, call up some witnesses. Ace Phoenix? Defense calls young cash register to the stand. Dog, I already testified. No, you fucking didn't. Mr. Broomstick, do you remember the events on the day the day Roger disappeared? Yeah, that motherfucker pulled out the motherfucking gat. Exactly. So don't you think it's reasonable for you and Baku to defend yourselves in that situation? Yeah, you are right. I mean, otherwise, we would have got shot. But he's still guilty. The fuck? How would he still be guilty if it was self-defense? Nah, he tried to kill two police officers. That's some fuck shit. <laughs> Look, the state is dropping my armed robbery charges. Bro. Um. This dude, Lil Broomstick. Oh, no. Young Cash Register, a.k.a. Lil Broomstick. He's got the same energy as, um, as Molson. If I testify against that motherfucker. This gotta be a fucking joke. <laughs> Fucking. Bro, imagine saying that in court. This is, that's some fuck shit. Look, the state is dropping my armed robbery charges if I testify against that motherfucker. This gotta be a fucking joke. Fuck it. I rest my case. I'm about to be in chain and shackles. Okay, let's hear the closing statement from the prosecution. Alright, to conclude this case, I don't know what the fuck happened really, but the defendant was clearly on that bull. So obviously he's guilty. That ain't no fucking closing statement. I, in the defense, look, he didn't do shit. One of the people he supposedly murdered is here in this room right now. The others are most likely still alive. I don't see how the prosecution proved guilt when there was no credible evidence to support his case. Facts. No bodies were found and the supposed murders were proven to be a fluke. My client is not guilty. Yes, he is. That motherfucker guilty. I hereby sentence you to 30 years in state prison on three counts of murder, reckless driving, and overall bullshitting. Are you fucking joking? Damn, I tried. Ace Phoenix, you got bitched on in this fucking courtroom. You ain't shit. You know what? I still got your money, dog. I'm chilling. Girl, my attorney showed up to this bitch off the of perks. <laughs> he over there sweating. Shut the fuck up. Bailiff, come get him. Alright, I see how it is. Look, I ain't never dropped nothing but school. But when I get out, y'all hoes gonna be dropping left, right. Casket business about to be booming. Better start counting your days <laughs> and your minutes. Bet, I'm going home. Yo, Phoenix, I'll hit you up again. Casket if business about to be booming. Situation. Bro, what a, what a street thing to say. Action. Yeah, I got you. That motherfucker had no chance. He'll be all right. 30 years ain't shit. <laughs> okay, but there's this video 
What the hell? I, I gotta stop doing this. I gotta stop going off on these tangents. Um, I, I wanted to show you this video. I have it all in my bookmarks here. I don't know if I'll watch the whole thing, but... In his book. What's up, Wisecrack? Michael again. So I'm just going to come out and say it. Sometimes I pine for my awkward teen years in the early 2000s. It was a simpler time, if you will. A time when frosted tips were cool, a cough would perhaps most importantly, was a time before Disney and J.J. Abrams got their hands on Star Wars. Now this Episode 3. Sure, it's not perfect but it truly strove for greatness. Like Greek drama greatness, complete with larger-than-life characters, ancient prophecies, and a lot of severed hands. Yeah. Just in a galaxy far, far away. And while the film is certainly no masterpiece, it, ambitious it can sure. actually teach us a lot about one of literature's most demanding genres, tragedy. So join me for this Wisecrack edition on Star Wars Episode 3, crafting it to let you guys know. First, who discusses the broiled in war, Chancellor Palpatine, the de facto head of the Republic, and a not-so-secret Sith Lord, gets foe captured by General Grievous and the Separatists. Obi-Wan and Anakin- I'm gonna- I'm, I'm gonna be right back. I'm gonna- I'm- I gotta do my laundry. So I'm gonna just let this video run. ...make a desperate bid to free the Chancellor, which leads to more severed hands and one murder count. When they return home, Anakin receives a hero's welcome, learns that his wife is pregnant, and then gets appointed to the Jedi Council. All's well that ends well, right? Not quite. As the Clone Wars draw to a close, Chancellor Palpatine solidifies his power in the Senate and the Jedi Council grows distrustful of Anakin's friendship with him. Worse, Anakin is plagued by prophetic dreams of Padme dying, dreams that Palpatine exploits. He had such a knowledge of the dark side, he could even keep the ones he cared about from dying. While Anakin initially snitches on the Chancellor for being a Sith, the young Skywalker eventually betrays the Jedi Council in hopes of saving Padme. Palpatine then executes the infamous Order 66 to exterminate all the Jedi, execute Order 66, and turns the Galactic Republic into the Galactic Empire, bestowing upon us one of our all-time favorite memes. So this is how liberty dies, with thunderous applause. The film concludes with Anakin spiraling into darkness, killing innocent children and force choking Padme before facing Obi-Wan in one final epic fight. The rest is history. Anakin is defeated, Padme dies in childbirth, and Darth Vader as we know him is born. No! In order to understand how George Lucas crafted a modern tragedy out of episode three and how it fell just short of greatness, we first have to look at the genre itself. In his book, Poetics, Aristotle defines a tragedy as a story about one great individual who experiences a reversal of fortune, thereby evoking pity or fear in the audience. And yes, episode three checks all these boxes. Anakin, thought to be the child of prophecy and destined for greatness, falls to the dark side and destroys everything he loved. We feel bad for him, it's not subtle. You were the chosen one! It was said that you would destroy this and not join them. But if we want to get into the real nuts and bolts of the tragedy, we need a more structural definition of the term. Literary critic Christopher Booker offers this definition of tragedy in his absolute brick of a text, The Seven Basic Plots. A tragedy is the story of a hero being tempted or impelled into a course of action which is in some way dark or forbidden. For a time, as the hero embarks on a course, he enjoys almost unbelievable dreamlike success. But somehow, the original dream has soured into a nightmare where everything is going more and more wrong. This eventually culminates in the hero's violent destruction. To Booker, this arc from temptation to destruction spans five simple steps. Importantly, we see Anakin's arc in episode three match this structure step for step. We start with stage one, the anticipation stage. This is the start of our journey, where we find our tragic hero unfulfilled and dreaming of greater things. As Booker is quick to point out, this isn't all that different from how our traditional non-tragic heroes start their stories. In non-tragic episode 4, for example, we open with a simple farmhand dreaming of adventure. In episode 3, we open with a dissatisfied hero who feels stifled by his superiors. As a result, he's pathologically reckless. In the first battle, he disobeys orders and tries to shoot off the drones swarming Obi-Wan's ship. Then, in a true hold my spotchka moment, Anakin tries to use his own ship to scoop them off. Of course, we will learn that Anakin only takes such dumb dumb risks in order to save his loved ones. 
But there's a darker component to this. Anakin has ambition. He wants power. We see this in his showdown with Count Dooku. Sense great fear in you, Skywalker. You have hate. You have anger. But you don't use them. And this is what sets the tragic hero apart from our traditional hero. Instead of answering your typical call to adventure, like Luke answering Leia's distress signal, the tragic hero answers a different call, the call to temptation. We see Anakin answer this call when he listens to Chancellor Palpatine and kills Count Dooku. Good, Anakin, good. <laughs> Kill him. It fills us with dread. This is the first step in Anakin's fall. He's given in to his desire for power. Here, the temptations of the Sith trump the teachings of the Jedi. This brings us to stage two, the dream stage. Booker defines the dream stage as the point where the tragic hero becomes in some way committed to his course of action. And for a while, things go almost improbably well for the hero. He is winning the gratification he had dreamed of and seems to be getting away with it. For Anakin, this means getting exactly what he wants. He's become a hero, his new bestie Palpatine is back in power, and he scores a seat on the Jedi Council. Of course, not everyone is happy with these developments particularly Anakin's fellow Jedi. But our young Skywalker just doesn't care so long as he can save Padme. Booker might call these events typical dream stage fare. The tragic hero remains reckless in their pursuit of their goal and is blinded enough by their subsequent success, so much so that they don't realize they're sowing the seeds of their own destruction. This is doubly the case for Anakin, who is so blinded by the power Palpatine okay, offers him that he doesn't realize he's slipping towards the dark side. And ironically, dooming both... Yeah, there's an interesting thing that I wanted to talk about, which is like when people chase power, like when you just when you try to define the colloquial definition of the phrase chasing power, there's there's a lot of different ways you can actually interpret that. But generally what what people consider is chasing control, control of your surroundings, control of your environment, control of your mortality in particular. And uh, this is this is that whole idea of why Karens are so hated, why they're like the the least least liked people in the world, why people who who try to um, uh, prevent these sorts of like they try to push themselves to live longer and longer and longer. They try to um, snuff out all of the possible painful events in their life and ignore all of it. Um, People don't realize that these things are also what make you human. Half of what makes you human is, is the tragedy that comes with being human. And so um, it's, not like, it's not like getting a disease from nature and dying is unjust in any way. It's, it's sad, tragic. It's not unjust. And when people try to seek control... For the sake of their own safety, for the sake of um, playing defense, it uh, it ends up ruining things for themselves and others. And um, eventually, there comes a point in a wise person's life where they need to realize that even if ultimate control was possible, you shouldn't want that. A a, a human that is even deserving of life shouldn't want that. Otherwise, you're not human anymore. Padme and himself. Next up is stage three, the frustration stage, when the tide begins to shift against our tragic hero. At this point in the journey, Booker says the tragic hero begins to experience a sense of frustration, and in order to secure his position, may feel compelled to- Tragic hero is, in this case, it's not a tragic hero, it's just a villain. Like if, if, you, if you fear more than you love, you're just a villain. Further dark acts, which lock him into his course of action even more irrevocably. In episode three, Anakin becomes increasingly frustrated with the limitations of his newfound success. While he might sit on the Jedi Council, his fellow Jedi will neither grant him the rank of master nor help him save Padme. And when Anakin sees another vision of Padme dying, this time with Obi-Wan by her side, his frustration- He fears Padme dying. He fears everyone dying. He fears losing control. He fears his own death. He fears not being able to protect people around him more than he loves the Jedi way. It's that simple. You could, 
there's, there's two solutions to this. You could stop the fear or you could increase the love. He did neither of those things. And hits its peak. Fed up with the Jedi and tempted by Palpatine, Anakin opts to save the Chancellor at the last minute. In a fit of An example of, of someone who, who, um, Palpatine's an example of someone who doesn't necessarily fear like that, but he just has no love. Desperation, he lops off hand number three while Mace Windu is forced lightning out the window. In saving Palpatine, Anakin finally commits that irrevocable act, the one which seals his fate. As if to underscore this point, Palpatine tells Anakin, When the Jedi learn what has transpired here, they will kill us. And those foreboding words bring us to stage four, the nightmare stage, in which the tragic hero finds himself alone with the forces of opposition arrayed firmly against him. That's exactly where Anakin lands after he betrays the Jedi Order and murders the last of the Separatists in the Mustafar system, only for Padme to confront him. In what amounts to a truly unhinged rant, Anakin admits to killing children and the Separatists alike, all for Padme's sake. Don't you see? We don't have to run away anymore. I have brought peace to the Republic. He looks like a 12-year-old child and like a 30-year-old simultaneously. I am more powerful than the Chancellor. I, I can overthrow him. And together, you and I can rule the galaxy. Make things the way we want them to be. In doing so, Anakin pushes away his last and closest ally and any real hope of redemption. It's crazy because this is the kind of lesson that you teach to people when, when you're teaching them that, that there's things in, in life more tragic than death. If, if someone dies, that's not a, that's not a, that's a neutral thing. Death is a neutral thing. But making them sad, making them miserable, making them hate you, that's far worse than them dying. When Obi-Wan steps out of the ship, Anakin misconstrues this all as an elaborate plot to kill him. In a desperate bid for control of the situation, he breaks out his soon to be signature move, the force choke. The only problem, it's on his wife. This bleakly transitions us into stage five, the destruction or death wish stage, in which our tragic hero will finally destroy himself. Isolated from all his friends and family, the end is now in sight for Anakin. After a heated lightsaber duel with Obi-Wan, the two stare each other down over a lava river. That's when this iconic exchange goes down. It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! You underestimate my power! Don't try it! Remember the pride and ambition that led Anakin to kill Count Dooku and court Palpatine's friendship? Here it leads him to believe that he can finally take down his former master, even with a fatal disadvantage. So how does that go for him? Yeah, Anakin more like Anna can't. Uh... And sure, Anakin doesn't experience a literal death here, but as he burns on the lava shores of Mustafar, cursing his old master, it's, metaphorical it's death. hard not to feel that the boy we met in episode one is metaphorically dead. Fittingly, in the closet. What? Bro, I, I swear, I've seen this video a couple of times before, but I did not, I did not know he was going to say that. ...of the film, he's reborn as the most iconic villain in cinema history. But here's the question, Wisecrack. If episode three stuck so closely to Booker's five-part structure, why does it still seem like it's messing up this whole tragedy? It's messing up on its execution, and in a lot of other ways. Thing. Now, maybe this is a lot to ask of the only decent film in a trilogy otherwise mired by mediocrity and... Sand. I don't like sand. But in all seriousness, we think the film fails in two key components of tragedy. Also, terrible acting really holds it back. One, the dramatic flaw, and two, destiny, and how they both interact with this five-part structure. The concept of the tragic flaw also comes from, you guessed it, Aristotle, which translated into its original Greek hamartia means to miss the mark, fall short, or err. In Aristotle's conception of the term, Hamartia is the mistake in judgment that sets our tragic hero on their path and ultimately dooms them. In Oedipus Rex, it's- Mmm, sound familiar? A mistake in the path in a single decision that ultimately dooms them. It's Oedipus's incessant desire for knowledge. At first, this desire brings him results. He solves the riddle of the Sphinx, saves Thebes, and becomes king. But this desire also guarantees his downfall. When the play starts, Oedipus is searching for the murderer of the previous king so he can stop a plague from ravaging his city. Except in this relentless quest for knowledge, he misses the mark. By which we mean Oedipus realizes that he killed the king, his father, 
banged the queen, his mother, and is truly and literally blind to the cosmic truth of the world. Importantly, this tragic flaw orders the action of the story. All of the characters' mistakes are born out of this deficiency. As they emotionally spiral into despair, this flaw only skyrockets in intensity, which is how we get our tragic arc. The problem with episode 3, though, is that this tragic flaw is a lot harder to pin down. Simply put, Anakin doesn't merely miss the mark in one way. He's angry, he's proud, he's ambitious, and sometimes he's just an all-around d**k. And in the philosophy of the Force, it's all kind of a packaged deal. And yes, before you smash that dislike button, I know the film goes to great lengths to explain all these disparate flaws as the outgrowth of one underpinning flaw. Fear. We can see this in both Yoda's warnings. Careful you must be when sensing the future, Anakin. The fear of loss is a path to the dark side. As well as in Dooku's rant. That's precisely what I've been saying, bro. Amblings. Sense great fear in you, Skywalker. Whether it's the Jedi or the Sith, it seems like everyone agrees that fear is the gateway drug to a lot of bad emotions. Except, when we sit down to analyze the film, fear alone doesn't really motivate a lot of Anakin's mistakes. Yeah, and that's why it fails. That's why it's not a great one. That's why it's not a great, great movie. If it did, then it would resonate a lot deeper with people because people intrinsically understand this sort of thing. And they go, yeah, it, fear would do it. But, yeah, no, he just seems like a, like a, a person who turns into a sociopath for really no apparent reason. It's a pretty solid video, though. And the rest, of, the rest of it, I think, is just a critique on the fact that they just missed the mark on that. <coughs> they got a few more videos like this actually related to it. <coughs> but yeah, even though the, con the execution was off, the concept is rings true. And that's... What I propose is most of the terrible decisions that we see made by people today is because they're scared of their own mortality. Not just, not just dying. Like, they're, like dying in a literal sense. Like they're scared of doing something that will render their lives unlivable. Whether they end up being unemployable or they end up in prison or something like that, you know? They're scared of having less of a life. They're scared of taking risks. They're scared to make mistakes. <laughs> But you need to be able to make mistakes. And it's a screwed up world where you, you're not allowed to make mistakes, where school discourages mistakes. You need to be able to fail, or at least be willing to fail. To, I, I saw this guy's Reddit post one time. And um, it was his job. It was like doing AMA, I think. And his job was to defuse bombs. And someone asked him, it was like, are you ever scared you're going to mess up? Like, do you ever get scared of that? And he goes like, not at all. I don't even think about it like that. As far as I'm concerned, if I mess up, then that's someone else's problem to deal with now. And that right there, that always stuck with me. This is recent. This is like 2017, 2018 or something like that. If I'm, if I'm given a situation where it's, if I succeed, then I become great. And if I fail, then I die. Well, that's actually not such a bad gamble, in my opinion, because I don't see death as a negative thing. From the perspective of a, a, a broader nature um, outlook, it's actually, death is a totally neutral thing. It's even positive, actually. But I'll get to, I'll get to that later. But first, I want to establish that it's not a negative thing. Like, damn, I need to turn the fan on. It's way too... My PC's heating up. Um, I need a water bottle.
Well, looks like I'm all out of water bottles. Anyways, um, let me set a, a timer here for 30 minutes so that I can uh, take my laundry out during that time. Actually, I'll do 25 minutes. Okay, I guess it just, it just starts on its own. All right. But yeah, I think this video is, I think we were done watching this. What was I saying? What was I saying? Um, the guy from Reddit. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. I need to, I, I want to first establish that death is not a negative thing, okay? Um, that, uh, let me, let me, if you look at death as just a neutral, it's just another part of life, then your actual, like, life portion of your life can be incredibly fun if you don't fear this other part of your life, if you don't fear losing, you know, or making mistakes. <laughs> like, you should welcome it, actually. Like, dying, doing what you love, that's something that people really appreciate. That's something that makes heroes. Who wants to be immortal, by the way? Well, a lot of people do, but they don't really know what they want exactly. Like, let's talk about what happens if you're immortal. First of all, your cancer, that's what it is. You want to know how to create an immortal human? Give them cancer in every part of their body, and they'll live forever. Cancer cells are immortal. Our cells have a limit to the amount of times they can divide. Um, generally, I think it's about 60, I believe, 40 to 60, depending on the cell. Um, and after that, cells just stop dividing and they die, and they become dust, basically. But cancer cells are not limited by this. Um... If you want to, if you really want to be accurate, if, if you're not immortal, then you're not cancer. You can either be mortal or cancer. Those are your two options. And, um, there was actually this video. Let me, let me pull it up. It was, um, it was like, uh. I'm a, I'm a dude, I'm 21 years old, so naturally, when this video showed up, I, um, I saw it. Bro, what? Where is it? This guy. Wait. Uh, wait, was it this? I think... The worst thing you can do for your skin is go tanning. Not only do they cause skin cancer... I think this is, I think this is the video. But they also accelerate aging rapidly. Hi, I'm Dr. Maneev Shah. Yeah, the, it's, it's, it's stupid when people do that, right? It's stupid when people try to change the, the, the natural order of their aging. Making that change is a really stupid thing, right? Well, let's see what else he has to say. Because there's stupid people like this, like this dude. Look at this dude, bro. You could just tell he's a stupid person. Like, he's very, very smart in one way because he's, you know, a doctor, dermatologist, right? So you could tell that he's he's not very smart. He just has a lot of facts that he learned uh, in school. Um, and then he has this title, which lets him show off. But he's also very stupid. Um, and I'll show that. And this is skin support. Forehead debate. Are you aware or basically this blue pop mation post inflammatory that eliminate your pimples pretty quick? I wish you having okay, a Okay, okay, this is it. This is it. Look, okay. look, this is very, very important, okay? Elbow Inc. asked, why is there no cure for hair loss? First of all, you know why there's no cure for hair loss? There's no cure for hair loss because hair loss is not something that needs a cure, it's not a bad thing. Hair loss is, is its communication. That's like saying, why is there a cure for hair? What is hair? Hair is communication. Hair is communication of, of fertility and health and youth and uh, energy and all of that stuff. It's, it's an important factor to consider when looking at people to actually judge them. 
that, oh, don't judge a book by No, yeah, judge a book by its cover. That's what covers are for. If you don't judge a book by its cover, you don't need a cover. Um, so, what's it called? There's no cure for hair loss because it's not something that needs to be cured. Because it's not a disease. It's not a bad thing. It's communication is what it is. It's a part of having hair. It's like asking, why is there no cure for hair growth? Like, that doesn't make any sense. But the reason why this makes sense to people is because they're scared. So they go, oh, I need a cure, I need a cure. No, you don't. You don't need to be scared. I wish there was because everybody, including myself, suffers from hair loss. We don't have an answer yet. Hopefully one day in my life. You don't suffer from hair loss. You just experience hair loss. You consider it suffering if you decide that it's suffering. If time we will have an answer. Hopefully, this is, this is why he's stupid. He's like, hopefully, hopefully we'll have an answer. No, no, you don't need one. But all of our cells go through basically a programmed death cycle. They can only live so long. They're all meant to replicate a certain amount of times and then eventually die off. It's interesting that he says that. It's like, why doesn't he connect the dots? This is how you can tell he's stupid because he went to school, he learned the facts, and he learned these two facts that, um, well, not these two facts, he learned this fact that clearly contradicts what he was saying earlier, but he says both in the same uh, same sentence without blinking. Like, he's like, yeah, our cells are actually programmed. They're intentionally programmed to stop replicating after a certain point. Like, nature has coded that into us and decided that what's best for us is that we shouldn't be all self-replicating. I believe uh, it's like 40 to 60, usually 60 um, replications. And after that, your cells um, stop replicating, depending on the cell. But yeah, this is, um, this is really stupid how he said that earlier, after he's saying this. He clearly understands. Like, yeah, there is intentional, natural programming in us to stop ourselves from replicating. And our hair cells are exactly the same way. And once they die off, you really can't get them back. And so we have treatments in dermatology that can actually stop the hair loss process, slow the hair loss process, maybe get you a few hairs back, but nothing that's a complete cure at this time. Hopefully one day we do, but if- That's so stupid. That's actually so stupid. He's, he, if you're a scientist, you go into dermatology because you're curious about it. But if you're, if you're a fucking idiot, you become a dermatologist and you give yourself that title, which you don't deserve to have, because you care about making your skin look a certain way rather than actually living a, a, a meaningful life and allowing your skin and your hair and your outward appearance to accurately to accurately reflect your your lifestyle and behavior and your choices and your health and your age and your current situation and all that stuff you shouldn't try to change any of these things things like makeup and all this stuff it's it's deception it's a, it's literally lies it's a, it's a lie People go into these fields so that they can lie better because they, they're not good enough at lying. So they want to lie better. That's what they, and they want to push the boundaries of lying. That's why they do it. If we ever have you a can tell by the way he looks. He's a fucking idiot. Cell, they were to continue to replicate forever and ever and never die off. That's exactly what cancer cells do. So we don't necessarily want that. We need to find something in between that lasts long enough that we can produce hair shafts forever, but not last long enough that it turns into a cancer. How stupid is what he just said? Like, think about that for a second. He said, he literally said, if you were to have a cell that replicates forever, that's cancer. So we want to have, um, we want to have a, a way for it to last forever, but we don't want it to be cancer. So like, what the fuck are you even saying? Like, he doesn't think like there's not a, there's not a th thought in that brain. There is, it's empty. It's hollow up here. He's literally, he literally just said, yeah, we want cancer, but we don't want cancer. So it would be nice if we could find a middle ground somewhere in there. Going off all smiley, like, yeah, you see, like, what the fuck are you doing, bro? And now, you could, you could make the argument that he just misspoke. That's literally what he said. He said forever. He literally said forever. Last long enough that we can produce hair shafts forever. Last, so he said last long enough, right? So maybe he misspoke and he meant to say, you want it to last long enough? but you don't want it to be forever. You don't want it to be cancer, right? Well, that's what we have. We already have that middle ground, that beautiful, incredible middle ground. We already have that. It's called how long it lasts right now. That's what it's for.
It's an indicator, and it's a valuable indicator. It's a commu- it's communication is what it is. It already lasts a long enough amount of time. People want things to last forever, and then they realize, oh, no, wait, you can't have it last, last forever. Well, I'd want it to last a good amount of time. It already lasts a good amount of time. This applies for everything in your life for the average person. The, the things that already last a long time in your life, uh, you know, your, your smooth skin, um, your, your non-wrinkly face, all that stuff, all of these things already last for the amount of time that they're supposed to last. But not last long enough that it turns into a cancer. Rocket. Like they, actually stupid. Actually stupid. But let me, let me, I have a, um, I have another video actually. I didn't even want to play this one. This is just one that I remembered. It's not one that I had in my bookmarks or anything. But literally if you you have two choices either be be cancer or be mortal take your pick if if you are if your cells keep dividing beyond around 60 right it's it's actually weird to think about like our cells have a limit to how many times they can divide and that limit is intentionally programmed into us and it's not necessarily that our cells are limited um, in their capacity to replicate forever. It's just that there's programming that turns off that capability after a certain point and, and shuts it down. But cancer cells are not limited by this. Cancer cells are the fearful part of your body that's afraid of mortality. They're scared of dying. And so cancer cells are cells basically shooting in the dark and going... I'm going to destroy all the other cells around me so that I get to live. They're selfishness. They're selfish cells. And they they try to shut off their core programming given to them by the rest of the body. Um, and they go, no, I don't want to follow these rules. I'm going to live forever. I'm going to replicate forever. Um, instead of actually following the core command of like the human. If, if you want to be accurate about this, you don't say immortal. You say cancer. Those are not... Th- that. That's actually what it is. And in theory, in theory, your cells actually do have the capability of being immortal. A.K.A. they have the capability of being cancerous. The aging process, as scientists actually work very hard to slow the aging process or to make people look younger or feel younger because people are so desperately scared And that creates a giant market for this. And so scientists are working very hard. Um, And generally it's it's, uh, understood that aging as a process, not as a bad process or a good process, aging as a neutral process, as another part of life, is deeply linked with your telomeres. And if you can rebuild your telomeres um, in other cells other than stem cells, um, this will allow you to prevent aging And this is what makes you cancer. That's literally what it does. Cancer rejects senescence as a part of life and tries to live forever. And that's why it's the villain. That's why everyone hates cancer. You know, we could become immortal. We could have, by the way. Like nature could have decided to, to, if you, in theory, this is not even like a stretch. Like maybe in, in our lifetimes, we could reactivate um, our telomerase and that whole gene expression that exists um, in, in, in most of our cells but is just turned off and we could in theory reach a, a, a biological type of lobster type of um, like Turritopsis dormi or whatever it's called style of immortality and your cells have the capability to do it but they don't do it. They don't. They choose not to. Like he mentioned earlier, they, they choose to stop self-replicating. It's programmed into us. And you have to wonder at that point. Like, he has the knowledge of this, but he's too stupid to actually think for himself. Like, why? And anyone with any hint of intelligence in their mind actually learns this and wonders, like, why, why don't they self-replicate? Like, why did evolution decide 
that the best course of action for our species was to give us a lifespan, a limited one, and not make us immortal. Like, why, if, if you know, if longevity is this so, oh, so important, longevity is not important. Longevity, people are just scared, so they consider it important. But if longevity was this oh, so important thing, that people are like, yeah, it's an ultimate good, you know, that's something we can call a good, then why the hell did evolution cut us off? Why did nature cut us off and put in play internal mechanisms to turn off the gene expression that repairs um, telomeres? It makes you wonder because, because it doesn't like cancer, because that's what you become. And these doctors, when they talk about like um, pre-cancer cells being exposed to DNA damage or whatever, on a, on a non-medical perspective, like on a humanitarian perspective, the, the concept of compartmentalizing cells as precancerous is actually fucking stupid. Like precancerous cells have uh, um, requirements, to, but, but in, in, the, in the medical field, but on a, on a human level, it, there is no such thing as precancerous cells because all of our cells are precancerous cells. All of them are. We humans are precancer. That's what human beings are. We're we're biological guinea pigs going through a multi-billion-year-long evolution experiment done by um, uh, uh, the 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 scientist aspect of nature and and many different many different forces all having different uh, uh eternal wills if you were to call it that this is all metaphorical by the way um this is how it works but it's not like i'm not talking about like some divine being or whatever controlling but all these different wills and one of these wills is to is to allow us to um, live forever, and it pushes for that. And that will has has essentially made cancer also a part of life for many, many different organisms. And its its ultimate uh, command, its ultimate purpose, is to one day create a self sustaining set of cancer cells to take over the entire species and maybe become um, turn us into that orange juice from Evangelion or, or like, or better yet, the Borg from Star Trek, at which point, you know, we would live, you know, I mean, we, we would survive, but would we even deserve to? Like if, if, if a person is just a bunch of lines of code in a computer, what, is there even anything really morally wrong with turning off the computer? And it's these people who push us to live longer and longer and longer that push us further towards this like dystopian future becoming a reality where everything is in our control. Biologists, I think biologists would disagree. They'll they'll say that immortality and cancer are two different things. But philosophers will put biologists to shame any day of the week. Secondly, wait, I don't think I said firstly at all. But moreover, the treatment that is used to suspend the, for the fear is control. If you have control over, it's not a cure, it's a treatment, but if you have control over the situation around you, then your fear temporarily gets suppressed and it grows, it grows, but it's suppressed. I will never fear not being loved if I can control girls with an aphrodisiac, right? Because I can always have that temporary uh, suspension of fear. There's a reason why aphrodisiacs are considered more evil in fantasy worlds than actual murder spells. Because death is not something to fear. But control over love, that is something you should fear. I will never fear financial instability if I can have all the money in the world, if I can steal from others, you know? It's, it's all things like this. It's, it's the bad things in life that result, that, that are the effect of 
of the fear, of the fear of wanting more control, of the fear of not having control. But what happens then? Like what happens if you have ultimate control? I'll, I'll show you what happens. It's, I actually saved this, this video just for this sort of thing. I'm actually about to load up a bunch more videos um, after, after this, uh, this one is playing, like while this one is playing, I'll load up a bunch more videos. Let's suppose that you were able every night to dream any dream you wanted to dream. And that you could, for example, have the power within one night to dream 75 years of time. Or any length of time you wanted to have. And you would naturally, as you began on this adventure of dreams, you would fulfill all your wishes. You would have we have this uh, internal, like, impulsive desire for control, right? So we would naturally control, control over our surroundings. Every kind of pleasure. And that's what pushes people to be tyrants, by the way, is control. That's why we hate tyrants. And after several nights of 75 years of total pleasure each, you would say, well, that was pretty great. But now let's, um, let's have a surprise. Let's have a dream which isn't under control. Well, something is going to happen to me that I don't know what it's going to be. And uh, you, you would dig that and come out of that and say, wow, that was a, a close shave, wasn't it? And then you would get more and more adventurous and you would make further and further out gambles as to what you would dream. And finally, you would dream where you are now. You would dream the dream of living the life that you are actually living today. That would be within the infinite multiplicity of choices you would have. Of playing that you weren't God. Damn. That's such a beautiful way to word it. Playing that you weren't God. Because everyone wants to play God. That's what happens when you achieve more control. Control over your environment and nature and your surroundings. You know, you, you see all these people you know, shaving down the entire world to put these buildings to make us safe and, and instill this, um, and feed this insatiable desire for us to protect ourselves from, you know, what would be a, a, a natural, uh, fear of like the primal, like, oh, we got to, uh, hide in this cave so that the bears don't come after us. But now we, we've taken it so far, like nobody's, Nobody's actually in danger. None of these people who live in these big cities are actually in danger of getting killed by a bear. But that's the problem. If you're going to chase control, you need to have the, the risk that comes along with it. You need to have the risk that inspires that, that inspires you to, to chase that journey, to grow. That's what growth is. But growth, chasing control is very different from having control. It's about the journey, not the destination. That's what people mean when they talk about the journey, not the destination. That is the most important quote ever. And that, that's what this is all about. If you reach the destination and the journey is no longer a part of your life, then you're not living a life that's worth living. You chase the journey um, as a fool because you, end, you start in a very low place and you chase the destination. And so that way you have the journey and you have a meaningful life. But nowadays people start at such an easy life. They start with so much control in their life that the journey is no longer there. So they chase the destination and they get no, they get no fulfillment in life because there's no growth. And so instead of playing God, you get enjoyment. A wise man gets enjoyment from playing that they aren't God. So then, this means that you're not victims of a scheme of things, of a mechanical world or of an autocratic God. The life you're living is what you put yourself in. 
Only you don't admit it. Because you want to play the game that it's happened to you. Because if you play life on the supposition that you're a helpless little puppet that got involved, or if you play it on the supposition that it's a, a frightful, serious risk and that we really ought to do something about it and uh, so on, it's a drag. There's no point in going on living unless we make the assumption that the situation of life is optimal. And it makes you realize, you see, how, how great things are. So in this idea then, everybody is fundamentally the ultimate reality. Not God in a politically kingly sense, but God in the sense of being the self, the deep down basic whatever there is. And you're all that, only you're pretending you're not. Crazy, right? We are what we should be. We are the, the living the lives. We, we are in the position to live the lives that we want to live, that we deserve to live, but we just pretend that we aren't. You actually want less control. You want nature to be random. You want to submit to nature. It's very, very odd. I mentioned this earlier, I think. If you replace the word God in most contexts, uh, with the word nature, things fit together like like a puzzle and all the pieces just slip the, the, the entire the entire religious um, ecosystem makes so much more sense and everything fits it like a glove. like you don't submit to God if you don't believe in God like a literal God, you submit to nature. You submit to the fact that there is this thing out there that is out of your control. And you know what? You should allow it to be out of your control. You submit to it. You submit to nature to, to leave your life up to the, the will of the greater environment. Jesus, take the will, right? Yeah, if you don't believe in Jesus, fine. Don't, not, not Jesus, take the wheel. The metaphorical life of taking the wheel, maybe occasionally you let things happen that's out of your control. You let your surroundings take the wheel of your life a little bit, you know? At least a little. Don't, don't chase leeching onto the wheel every possible chance you get. Maybe take a little risk every once in a while. You may not actually realize that this is what you want, but once you have it and you experience the happiness that's beyond comprehension that comes with chasing control in a world without control, where there is no way for you to actually reach the destination, um, and you're just chasing it, and that chasing leads to your growth, that's when you understand what it means to be a part of nature, to be one with the world, like people say, to be one with nature. And then you hear what people in religion say, oh, you, when you die, you become one with God. Y yeah, you become one with nature. And it's this separation, it's, it's this decisive, separate, um, like, oh no, everything in nature can, can, you know, like we treat nature differently from humans, even though we're animals. Like, oh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't um, call a, a jaguar evil for uh, killing a, a zebra or a deer, right, and eating it, right? But why do we call humans wrong for killing animals and eating them? Why is that considered wrong on our part? Why do we separate humans from nature? And that's what leads to all the misery in the world. You shouldn't separate humans from nature. We are nature. And this sort of thing is easier said than done. I get that. All credit to... It, it's, it's not an easy thing to take this to heart. Um... But it's, it's possible, and it's a journey, and people should do that. It's the modern struggle. Um, Naval, in his podcast with, uh, with jo Joe Rogan, would always talk about, like, oh, the modern struggle is not the struggle of um, scarcity. It's the struggle of abundance. You know, naturally, people chase having a lot more social interaction, more friends, right? People chase that. They want that. 
But that's because throughout all of history, people didn't have enough. Now we have too many. So now people are chasing the wrong thing. They're chasing having more friends, but they already have way more than they should have. People uh, would chase food, but they now they already have way more people today. There are more people dying today of obesity than there are dying of starvation. Like, if you want to chase food, you want that to be a, a, a fundament of, of your life, then there should be more people at least dying of uh, starvation than of obesity. That should be the game that you play. That should be the life that we choose if we're going to if we're going to chase this destination. We should choose a journey with a starting point where we have less food, not more food. We want more, more friends, more social interaction, more attention, more sex, more all stuff. So with the dating apps and all that's it's it leads to a world of abundance where we chase even more abundance when really it's not the destination that we're meant to have in life. It's the destination that we're meant to chase and the journey that we're meant to have. And the journey doesn't exist if we're already at the destination from birth. Which is why I don't pity people who are born in poverty. I pity people who were born in wealth. Also, there's another thing that causes people to... Like, people not, don't just want to avoid the risk. A lot of people want to live forever because they feel like there isn't enough time. Like, there's not enough. You know, maybe, maybe just another hundred years. Maybe just another few hundred. They want, they want more chances to accomplish their goals. Not only do they want to live longer, they want to live uh, healthier longer, right? They want to they wanna be... Uh, um, you know, guys want to be 25 for their entire life and girls want to be 18 for their entire life you know they're afraid and this also comes from fear this is all just fear every bad thing like every every villainous every evil thing in life comes from fear it be, it's because people are afraid bullies are the most afraid people and when people are afraid that just one lifetime won't be enough to accomplish their goals, the things that they want to do. This is stupid. Because let's say you can live 10 lifetimes, right? Is that any better than one? What would you do if you could live 750 years? What would you do in 10 lifetimes that you couldn't do in one? Become a billionaire? Find love? Study the great stories told by the greatest storytellers? Tell the great stories? Make music? Learn languages? explore the world, write a book. What could you possibly do in 10 lifetimes that you can't accomplish in one? All of these things, you can accomplish all of these in one. We were made to live the one lifetime that we were given. That's how the lifetime um, was formed. If we were made to live 10 lifetimes, then that's what we would consider one lifetime. But this is it. This is what we were meant to do. This is what all we know. And it's it's what we're supposed to have. All and when people deviate from that, they become the villains. And for good reason. All of the reasons that people come up with in their head as to why they'd want to live longer, they don't think about it deeply enough. It's very surface level. It's just excuses. And it's so that they can feed this idea that, oh, I just want more time to do all these things, but they can all be achieved in one lifetime. People are just delaying it. They're, if anything, it's making them lazier. If anything, chasing a longer life makes people lazier because it's giving them an excuse. What happens if those people become immortal? Like, if you are sure, if you are absolutely sure, if you're guaranteed to still be here tomorrow, well, why do anything at all? Because there's always tomorrow. There's no reason to do it today. So it's only when you're able to... It's, a, it's this journey, but when you reach the point where you're able to stare death in the eyes and thank him and embrace him for giving you a mortal life, for giving you a limited life so that you can, you can actually understand a, a, tr a time scale of... of uh, of urgency so that you can live every day to the fullest and 
not think about, I always see people think about, oh, uh, you know, when this comes around, you know, maybe when I'm this old, I'll be doing this thing. Even the whole idea of, of knowing how old you are and keeping track of what year it is and keeping track of the month, every single year I hear the same things over, oh my God, I can't believe half the year is already over. It feels like it just started. And it's like, okay, yeah, if you say that once, like as if it's some crazy revel- revelation, like, wow, I, I can't believe that. But I hear that every year from the same people over and over and over again. Like, dude, are you, do you have short-term memory loss? Yeah, the years are short. Has it not set in after you experienced that one time? Move on, on to the next next thing. It's short. So stop contemplating its shortness and actually a- achieve something. And you would think that this sort of mentality, I believe this is a defense mechanism so that uh, there's one part of your brain that keeps reminding you of your mortality um, and it could make you miserable, but that part of your brain is doing it for good intentions. It's doing it so that it can instill a sense of urgency like, hey, do the things you want to do. But when people focus so much on the time and the age and the numbers of it all, rather than the feeling of it all, they get so caught up in the whole idea of like, What's the point of knowing how old you are? What's the point of knowing what day it is? Or what week it is? Or what you... Like, let's say you're not working out. And it's it's December 28th. All right? It's about to be January 1st. Most people, most people that I found at least, if they're not working out at that time, and they know they should work out, they'd go like, you know what? New Year's is coming up. When New Year starts, I'm going to work out. And it's those people who are always the laziest. Because it's like, what difference does it make? Why even think about the time of day or, or why do any of that? You give it your all every day. If you're, if you're, um, if you're like, oh, I want to accomplish this great thing by the time I'm like 30. Well, if you, if it's possible, if giving it your all every day achieves that, then that's what you do. You don't think about doing it by the time you're 30. And what happens if you can give it your all every single day and you can't achieve it by the time you're 30? Well, then why even have that goal in the first place? It's impossible. There's only one thing to do. There is no other option. You you go 100% in every moment of every day. You live every day to the fullest. Carpe diem. You give it your all. You put in 100% energy all the time. You never let off the gas. That's the only option. Because what difference does it make? Is there ever a, a, a decision that can be made? Is there ever a understanding that you can have that will allow you to do any less than that? Like, oh, uh, I'm, I'm, if somebody contemplates the fact that they're 12 years old or the fact that they're uh, 50 years old, does that make a difference in, in the decision to go 100% in every day? Does that allow you to have an excuse to say, you know what, today I'll give it a 80% effort? No, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what what the numbers say, the arbitrary numbers of where the earth is on its orbital path around the sun. It doesn't none of that stuff matters. You give it your all every day, you forget about everything else. And people who fixate so deeply on these things, they're the ones who do the least in life. But when you can actually when you can actually let go of the numbers and stop fearing them and stop, oh my God, I need to think about the numbers, think about the numbers. But when you can actually hug death and, and, and be like, thank you, death, for giving me a limited life, that's when you actually feel that burning sense of urgency. And it's not a bad kind of burning. It's a beautiful and, and life essence kind of burning urgency to accomplish your goals because you may not be here tomorrow. So you better get going today. Honestly, I'm kind of tired of talking. (laughs) I'm just gonna play another video. I got a whole set of videos ready to go. And um, I I got videos on a bunch of topics, but on this topic, I think I have the most saved. It's really coming in clutch. Because this is a topic that I'm interested in, and I could talk about it all day with people. It's just, talking about it myself is lonely and it drains me. I'm just going to play these videos. This is another one from the same channel. Now, 
By the way, if anyone wants to, like, hop in my Discord server and, like, talk to me about this stuff and, like, just stream with me and just have these discussions, I'm so down. My Discord server is, it should be in the description of wherever you're looking, on YouTube or on Twitch or wherever. My Discord server will be there. You can hop in and just chill with me, all right? Anyone, I'm on there all the time and just hop in the VC and just talk to me, all right? Because I, I just, I love talking about this stuff and it would be really nice if I had someone to talk about it with. There really isn't anything radically wrong with being sick or with dying. Who said you're supposed to survive? Who gave you the idea that it's a gas to go on and on and on? And we can't say... Oh, I'm about to go do my laundry. I'm about to uh, put in a different load real quick and put the current load in the dryer. I'll be right back. I'm going to just play this. That it's a good thing for everything to go on living. And the very simple demonstration that if we enable everybody to go on living, we overcrowd ourselves. That we're like an unpruned tree. And so, therefore, uh, one person who dies, in a way, is honorable because he's making room for others. And the panic that all life everywhere must be saved, although each one of us individually will naturally appreciate it when anybody saves our life, if we apply that case, you see, all around, we can see that it's not workable. We can also look further into it and see that if our death could be indefinitely postponed, we would not actually go on postponing it indefinitely. Because after a certain point, we would realize that that isn't the way in which we wanted to survive. Why else would we have children? Because children arrange for us to survive in another way. By, as it were, passing on a torch so that you don't have to carry it all the time. There comes a point where you can give it up and say, now you work. It's a far more amusing arrangement for nature to continue the process of life through different individuals than it is always with the same individual. Because as each new individual approaches life, life is renewed. And one remembers how fascinating the most ordinary everyday things are to a child. Because they see them all as marvelous, because they see them all in a way that is not related to survival and profit. When we get to thinking of everything in terms of survival and profit value, as we do, then the shapes of scratches on the floor cease to have magic. And most things, in fact, cease to have magic. So therefore, in the course of nature, once we have ceased to see magic in the world anymore, we are no longer fulfilling nature's game of being aware of itself. There's no point in it anymore. And so we die. And so something else comes to birth, which gets an entirely new view. And so nature's self-awareness is a game worth the candle. It is not, therefore, natural for us to wish to prolong life indefinitely. But we live in a culture where it has been rubbed into us in every conceivable way that to die is a terrible thing. And that is a tremendous disease from which our culture in particular suffers. And we notice it firstly in the way in which death is swept under the carpet. This is one of the major problems in hospital work. 
when a family conspires with the doctor to keep from grandmother the knowledge that she is dying. Grandmother suspects that she is dying, but probably doesn't really want to know for sure. And her family talk with her in such a way as to say, well, it'll be, you, you, you'll probably be getting all right in a few weeks. And won't it be nice to be able to do this, that, and the other, uh, because they have this funny feeling that it's important to build up courage and hope. And so they become liars and a mutual mistrust. Yeah, it's important to build up courage and hope. Building up courage and hope for the sake of life, not for the sake of survival. And death is a part of life. This is not building up courage and hope in favor of life. It's building up courage and hope against life. Develop. And so they become liars and a mutual mistrust develops. Uh, because once you are playing the game on that level, you tend to play the mistrust on other levels. So the person is left to die alone, suddenly, unprepared, and doped up to the point where death hardly happens. And there is no... That's tragic. That's actually tragic. What's, what's real tragic is when someone doesn't die. Derivation from it of the peculiar spiritual experience that can it's, come. It's sad. It's sad to think about. Like, when I think about my little cousins, like, I, I can't imagine them, you know, on their deathbed. And, like, it's, it's really sad for me to think about as a human. It's, it's only natural, right? But I know better. I know what's worse, being sad or experiencing tragedy. I know what's worse. With death. So you see, this is always the opportunity presented by death. That if one can go into death with eyes open. With love. To give up before you die. This extraordinary... You can guarantee that death will run its course. It will do its job, right? If, you, if you're relying on someone to do their job and you know 100% they'll do it, you can give up. You can let go. You can submit. You can, you can relax. You can go, all right, you take care of the rest. I'll, I'll leave it up to you. I love you enough and trust you enough to leave it up to you so you don't be scared. And it will do its job. I think can happen to you. So that from your standpoint, in that position at that time, you would say, I wouldn't have missed that opportunity for the world. Now I understand why we die. The reason we die is to give us the opportunity to understand what life's all about. By letting go. Because then we come to a situation that the ego can't deal with. When we are no longer hypnotized by that, then our natural consciousness can see clearly what all this universe is for. So, therefore, we have missed this golden opportunity by institutionalizing death out of the way instead of having a socially understood acceptance of death and rejoicing in death. So it follows from that, you see, that if any one of us could at this moment be as one about to die, genuinely and honestly, we would understand the mystery of life. Because death is the 
is in a certain sense the source of life. Just as we see in nature when the leaves fall from the trees, they mold and rot, and this supplies humus from which more plants can grow. It's a cycle like that. But in every circle way, symbolic and otherwise, human beings try to stop that cycle. Unamuno said, human beings are the only species that hoard their dead. And therefore, with the ghastly art of the mortician, we try to make the body unpalatable to the worms, and so to stop life, as if... Yeah, if you stop death, you stop life. What a beautiful way of looking at it. Because life is a cycle, and that cycle includes death. You stop death, which is a simple part of that cycle. You stop life as a cycle. Beautiful, beautiful. To be eaten in due course were an indignity. People always tell me, because I don't, like, I, people idolize whenever people die. And I think those are the people who are, like, if you want to know if someone is scared of death, Ask them, okay, what are your favorite rappers? And if they say, oh, uh, X, Juice World, Lil Peep, if they say all that stuff, say, oh, Bankroll Fresh, like oh, they, they, they just go through the list of all the dead rappers, chances are they're, well, chances are they're also insecure. They're extremely insecure about their tastes um, because it's a very uncontroversial thing to be, um, to be fans of dead people. But... They're also scared of their own mortality because they want to respect the dead so much because um, they're scared that when they die, because they can relate, they're scared that when they die, people will forget about them, which is a part of the cycle of life. People will forget about you no matter whether you like it or not. And they should. It happens because it should happen. And these people are so scared that uh, of stopping the cycle that it leads to, like, remember when Chadwick Boseman died? He got, like, 3 million Instagram followers on the day of. None of those people actually cared about Chadwick Boseman. They only cared about him after he died. And it, people hate it when you disrespect the dead. And I have no problem, like, I, I tell people, like, yeah, I was never really a fan of Lil Peep. I didn't like Lil Peep. I had the opportunity to go to a Lil Peep concert three days before he died. And I said no. I'm like, I'm not really a fan of his music. And I tell people no. I don't really like his music. They go, why would... People, people like him so much more now that he's dead, but I'm not going to switch it up because you're dead. And in the same way, there's actually a beauty in it because even though that's cruel on my part, there's a beauty that comes along with it on the other side that other people don't experience that I experience. I respect deeply the people who are alive, the people who actually deserve my respect. Because if I were to follow someone on Instagram like Chadwick Boseman or whatever, and I think to myself, would I follow them if they were dead? And if I say yes, I follow them when they're alive. People, like, I remember that literally, literally the day that um, Juice World died, everyone was like, oh, uh, Juice World had the most influential album of the decade and all stuff, best album. But, and I'm like, why would you say that right now? If you didn't say that yesterday when Juice World was alive to see it, if you wouldn't say it yesterday, you don't get to say it today. Because he's not around to see it. You're doing this for, for, for brownie points, for social brownie points, to act like you were a part of the part of the crew. And now that that option is gone, you want to act like you were there for it. If you if you weren't going to say that Juice World had the best album of the year or whatever before you before he died, you don't get to say it after he died. And so in that way, I never miss an opportunity to actually appreciate people that I believe are worth appreciating. Like, I, I tell people, oh, yeah, Logic is corny. And when Logic dies, I, I'm going to tell people he's corny. I make a point, like, I consider it one of my dreams to collaborate one day with Kanye. And when he dies, I'm going to be telling people the same thing. If if he dies before I get to collaborate with him, I'm going to tell, like, I'm going to, to not only tell people, like, oh, I, I was a part of the part of the movement, I'm going to be a part of the movement. I'm going to make a point of it. I'm going to put real effort into into reaching out to Kanye and actually collaborating with him in the studio a little bit. Not like I don't make music like that, but I want to I want to just be a part of the process. I want to be involved. I want to uh, you know, be involved in the cover arts and in um in the promotional material and all that stuff. I want to I want to 
be a part of the movement, basically, you know? And so I show great respect to people. Like, the things that people say about dead people, I say that about them when they're alive. I show them that respect when they're alive. And I want people to do the same for me. I Be the change that I want to see in the world. If I die and people say, oh, Afraz was so smart, he was so great. Bro, say that to me when I'm alive, when I can actually appreciate it. When I'm dead, I don't care. That doesn't matter to me. I'm not going to be able to... But, oh, thank you, when I'm dead? No, tell me when I'm alive. So yeah, if you're, if you're going to say that when I'm dead, don't bother. That's pathetic. The human being. Whereas we eat everything else and we give nothing back. So that is a kind of a social symptom of our profound disorientation with respect to death. Of, of, a, of stemming from fear. Death is a stripping away of all that is not you. The secret to life is to die before you die. It's hard to understand. I don't know if I fully understand that quote. I'm going to need to think about that more later on. I get this first part. This second part, if it's referring to ego death, um, doing something your ego can't handle, that seems a bit... Um, depends on how old this is. Because if it was a lot older, then that would seem a lot more profound. But if it's something that they talk about nowadays, I mean, like, bro, everyone knows about ego death when they're, like, 13 years old and they're watching podcasts on YouTube about people licking toads and stuff, you know? It's kind of surface level now. But that's because of the product of what the world has become. What a beautiful video. And it's, it goes hand in hand because Alan Watts really preaches this idea of not, of not um, considering yourself to be separate from others and separate from nature. Like if, if the, the world is a river, you don't imagine yourself as a cork floating down the river. You imagine yourself as a part of the river, as the river. You are the world. You're, not, you're never stuck in traffic. You are traffic. And when you adopt this um, this mentality, this attitude, and you embed it deep within your brain, and you allow it to guide your decision making, it makes you just much happier. Like I thought about that deeply, and I would always tell myself, I'm not stuck in traffic, I am traffic. And I said that enough to the point where now, I never road rage, even when it's actually baffled me. It's, 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 it's crazy. I didn't know this kind of thing was possible. I didn't know this level of peace of, of self, uh, inner peace and like harmony was possible. Like, I would be in situations where someone would cut me off and they'd flick me off and all that stuff. And um, I'd be like, I should totally road rage right now, right? Like I have every right to road rage, but I don't feel like it. It feels like a waste of my time. It feels like a waste of my energy. I, I have no desire to, to get angry at them. So like, why would I do that? It's, I become a wiser person. And it all stems from getting rid of the fear of death. And not only that, it's not just getting rid of the fear of death, it's acting on it. It's allowing yourself to submit to that. It's letting go of the control of, of when you'll die. I don't know when I'll die. And I don't really care. It doesn't matter. I'll die. It'll happen when it happens. Whatever happens tomorrow, happens tomorrow. It's out of our control. Tomorrow is a mystery. You could die tomorrow. And there's nothing you could do to stop it. And eventually, you will die. You can either accept it or run from it. And I choose to accept it. And once I've accepted it, I stop thinking about it. There's no point in spending mental energy dwelling on something that I already know. It's like, if you know one plus one is two, then why would you stress over it? Oh my God, is one plus one two? Is one plus one two? Is it? Is it? I, I yeah, I, I know it is. Why would I? It's not. It's not in my control. It's not up for me to change. I can't just decide one plus one is three, just like how I can't decide when I die. It's it's out of my control, and I I know it will happen. Is there's not two things guaranteed in life. There's one thing guaranteed in life. No, actually, there's two things guaranteed in life. Death and suffering. 
humans are entitled to two things, death and suffering. And so this thing that I can be absolutely sure will happen, why the hell would I spend any energy at all thinking about it when I can think about other things? And that frees my mind. It's, it's like escaping a mental prison that I see other people still in. Majority of people around me, I see them still in it. And it's like, like think about it like a friend, like a very, very trusty friend, okay? If I'm delegating work to somebody, oh, okay, I'm going to write the JavaScript, my buddy's going to write the CSS. If I absolutely know he'll do his job, I have the guarantee, hypothetically, right? Even though there's no guarantee about anything. But if I have this absolute guarantee that he never fails, why the hell would I supervise him? Why would I constantly call him like, hey, bro, do you do the CSS yet? I just want, uh, are you on track? Uh, uh, what can I do to make sure it's on time? Like, it'll be done. And just like that reliable friend, death operates in the same way. He will do his job. He doesn't ever fail, ever, whether you like it or not. So you might as well like it. You know, there's a saying um, said by one of the wisest souls to ever exist. Yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That is why it is called the present. And when he was saying that, you know, the context was, was stopping Poe from worrying. He was too concerned about what was and what will be. He was so he was contemplating, thinking, do I quit or not quit? Do I noodles or not noodles? So much thinking, so much wasting precious mental energy about thinking about things that he has no control over. Tomorrow is a mystery. Stop trying to control it. Let it be a mystery. There's no fun in life if you can control everything, if you have no surprises. And you might say, oh, well, I just want a little bit of control. It doesn't matter how much control you want. If it isn't 100% control, then you risk dying, plain and simple. So there's no point in fearing death. If you, if you understand the idea of a life worth living requires you to not have 100% control, then that also comes with the understanding that a life worth living comes with death. And if you, if you worry about death, it'll make life a lot less meaningful. It's counterproductive, and it'll actually bite you in the ass eventually. It's what screws you over. People who aren't scared of death don't experience the horrors that people who are scared of death do experience simply because of their fear. In fact, to a certain degree, for, cert for some people, not for everyone in society, you know, we have roles in society. You know, there are people in society who, who um, are more prone to pushing uh, humanity to be safer. And there's more people in society who are more prone to pushing humanity to take more risks. And those people who push humanity to take more risks, as, as, uh, as mean as it might sound, those are the people who actually um, gain respect and go down in history as the heroes. You should chase the risk. If there isn't something that you risk dying to achieve, there's no glory in it either. If death does not pose a risk, then life doesn't present a meaning. It's like Helen Keller's said, Helen Keller's uh, people said, Life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. And you, you bring this full circle. Remember when I said earlier that there's a will that nature has, a force of nature that is imposing its will onto evolution, trying to create a species that will live forever, basically? Because we're not individuals, we're a species. So... This is actually a part of it. You know why none of the other human species survived? Because th whenever they found water, any water source, they stuck, they stayed where they are. Is that we're safe here? We don't need to go out and take more risks. Not humans. We went, we found the uh, like Mediterranean, and we're like, nah, this is boring. I'm done. I, I don't like being safe. I want to take risks. And they went out and they went to the goddamn desert and most of them died and 
people died as individuals, but the species survived. All other human species played it safe. They all went extinct. Like, think about how many people must have died on the journey to Easter Island until somebody finally found it. And they, they built those heads. Remember that? Not remember that as if we were there. I'm, I'm talking about, you guys know what I'm talking about? Like, there are people among us who chased the risk. And those are the people who actually uh, kept our species alive this whole time. They themselves might have died, but the species survived. Which is why we have such profound respect for uh, heroes who take those risks. Which is why, part of the reason why, uh, men don't live as long as women. Because they take more risks. Because they're more prone to risks. Which is why almost all of the people who end up achieving great things, like things that are world-renowned that they go down in history for, they were almost all men. Because men were the ones taking the risks. People like to assume that, oh, we're just patriarchal, men were just in control. No. If they were in control, then they would be having all the spoils of... Uh, all, all of the... They would reap the rewards of humanity's hard work, but they wouldn't experience the consequences of it, the harsh consequences. You know, men not only are richer than women on average... They're also poorer. There's more homeless men. There's more men living in poverty. There's more men dying of starvation. There's more men in prison. You, you see societies where, where uh, people are struggling. The men don't eat. In fact, they themselves voluntarily don't eat. They get the women and children to eat because they realize that their lives, their roles, their gender role, as I might say, even though it's not necessarily a gender role, it's more of a, a spectrum on masculinity, role is to take more risks is to risk their lives for the sake of the species and so you end up with the this this odd disparity where these feminists go like oh men have all the great things okay i'll give you that men also have all the terrible tragic things that women don't want men are they, they are, they're forced into a military draft i was forced into it now uh my name's on the thing so if, you know, if, if America ever goes to war, there's always the risk that I'm, I'm going to war. But not the girls that I grew up with, not them, but the, the homies I grew up with, the guys, yeah, they can come to war with me and there'd be nothing we could do about it. There'd be nothing, no way for us to avoid it. There's almost all violence is perpetrated by men and almost all of the victims of violence are men. It's, it's almost everyone in prison is men. Almost all suicides are men. Like that alone should speak for itself. Yeah, almost all of the people who have achieved great things in life are men, but almost all suicides are men. That should tell you everything right there. Yeah, men, you know men who drive Uber make 7% more than women? Not because Uber has some system in it that just decides they're going to pay men 7% more. That's because men drive 7% faster. So yeah, it's, it, it all, it actually checks out. These feminists are, are completely, complete bullshitters. And that's because the majority of feminists come from either women who have very little masculinity or men who have even less masculinity, who are, uh, you know, simps or like cucks or whatever, who, um, have no, no respect for the, the part of their brain that goes out and decides to take risks for the species and actually be a man that wants to abandon that gender rule because they're scared of it. And that's how you get the, the situation that we're in right now. It's, it's simps over many, many millennia that have essentially given the collective... Um, you know, when you take a whole bunch of people, you know, you know what, what group polarization is? Let's say you take a, a group of people and you, you say, okay, who likes ice cream more than cookies? Uh, you guys go into this side. Who likes cookies more than ice cream? You go into that side. Most of them will be like, I like cookies more, but only like barely more. And most people on the other side will be like, I like ice cream more, but only a little bit more. You separate them into those groups though. And you tell them, talk about why you like it more. You let them talk about it for an hour. You know what they'll do? They'll come back. 
and they'll go, oh yeah, cookies are way better than ice cream. And the other guys will go, ice cream is way better than cookies. You separate people into, um, into, into categories and you let them only interact with each other, what happens is they become extremists. And so when you allow a whole bunch of women to go unchecked and a whole bunch of non-masculine men, so a, a whole bunch of people with very little masculinity, like remember when BuzzFeed took those tests and like all of their male staff had da like medically dangerously low levels of testosterone? Like that's what happens when you get all these people together. They become extremists and they force the world into, um, they, they force control. They, 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 they let their fear take over. It's these hyper-masculine men that have no fear of anything. The love doesn't even matter because they just have no fear. And so they'll, they'll do what heroes do regardless. They'll push the world to greater heights. They'll keep the species alive. That's what we admire about them. That's why we admire them, because they kept the species alive. And these, the, the, these men have been basically a dying breed because the majority of people have just been being swallowed up by this ideology of, oh no, we should, we should be safer, we should be safer. We should make people harmless. We, sh we shouldn't be monsters. We should, all these things are bad. You know, death is evil. All these things are evil. So we should uh, want to preserve um, life and longevity. When really, longevity and all this stuff is not uh, axiomatic good. There's nothing meaningful about the, about the collective extremist feminine consciousness uh, forcing simps to do their bidding over millions of years unconsciously that has led to the world that we live in right now where people are born into lives that pose zero risk. If you aren't giving it 100%, listen, not, risk is not for everyone. Some people are going to be afraid of death and rightfully so because that also helped the species to survive. We need a balance. And for the people out there, who, who resonate with the, this message, who say, no, I am one of those people who will chase the glory and put my life on the line to do so. I will die for what I believe in. My advice to you is the way you can look at it is you're already dead. Might as well risk it. It's going to happen. So what's the harm? I don't know how exactly to, to, to tell you like, people who don't resonate with this, you guys can leave. You, it doesn't matter for you guys. But people who do see this as, like, who, who do resonate with, the, with the, um, the thought that I don't want to survive, I want to live. Survival doesn't matter to me. Living matters to me. People who resonate with that, that's the only people I want in my audience. And for you guys... I don't know exactly how to get over the fear of death. I don't know like a specific, you know, step-by-step -step process. I hear psychedelics is a pretty tried and true method uh, sometimes. Uh, depends on, depending on psychedelics. Psilocybin, from what I've heard, um, one or two or maybe three uh, treatments seems to have a, not, not a majority, but a significant success rate under the right conditions. But I've never tried it. So I'm not really in a position to speak on it. But whatever it is, my advice to you would be try to figure it out. And once you figure it out, do it. Consider it a priority. It'll make life infinitely better. Not being afraid of death, that is the closest thing you can get to these like miracle cure-all drugs that they market. Like, you know, these cults marketing these substances that can cure literally any Ill illness yeah, not fearing death is the same thing as those miracle pills, except it's real and attainable and free. I think um, the YouTube channel, I really love this YouTube channel called Pursuit of Wonder. Uh, I have some videos by them. Let me, let me link them. Um, I'll put them in, uh, if I put them in chat, then, then people on YouTube watching this way later, I have one viewer. So I'm going to put them in here so that way people can actually see this for the future. Okay, so there's this, Pursuit of Wonder. 
life and death and how to deal with the thought of dying. I'm not going to play these videos right now. I know. It's, it's, we're, I'm, dude, so much time has passed since I started streaming. What have I been streaming for like nine hours now? Yeah, no, no, longer than nine hours. Um, the beauty of death and how to think about your mortality. That's, that's another one. This is like entering the realm of like, this guy's a very, very intellectual dude. Why am I not? So, oh, I'm on a different channel. But um, this sort of, these videos, they enter more the realm of not necessarily that death is a neutral thing, but more like death is a positive, which is, which is a, uh, this one, I think watch this one first. Watch this one first before you watch it. Or watch them in order of uh, upload dates. Um, and then there's this one. Watch all four of the... Actually, they, I think they are in the correct order state. But yeah, I would say watch all four of these in the order that I presented them to you or whatever the order date is. Uh, figure out the order date and, and watch these four videos that I've just shown you. Um, keep them in your bookmarks and watch them at random times like, uh, you know, throughout the week. And do this for like... I would say watch them twice a week. All four of these videos, watch them twice a week for eight weeks in a row, eight weeks, all right? I don't wanna give you too much homework, but watch these videos twice a week for eight weeks in a row. So each video you have watched 16 times. And yeah, that, that many, um, that many times? No, okay, that's, that is too much. Okay, watch one of these videos. Let's really spread it out. Watch one of these videos a week, just one per week. Like I do it like every Friday or whatever. And watch them all three times total. All right. I don't want to like that's some the earlier the, the, the former former thing is something I would do because I'm like I'm like deep, deep in this stuff. Like I want to memorize the quotes from what people said. Um, so that I can have it on standby. But like, if you're just trying to just trying to take it to heart and you don't care about like educating others all that much, then three watches of each video should be enough. So watch one of these a week at random times for 12 weeks in a row. So you'll have watched each four of these videos three times each. And uh, oh, oh wait, this one too, this one too. Actually, this one is, um, this one's a bit, a bit less related, I think. I know because I've watched all of these. Um, so I don't think this one's as related as the others. Uh, this one's less about the actual deep fear of death and more about the fear of uh, not doing much in life. So this is, it's a, it's a great addition. So after you take the other ones to heart, you can watch this and... Um, and take that one to heart as well. And watch that one at your own discretion. Um, in, but in reality, this video is generally... You should do this because it's it's like a... What's this? I want to I play that next. I always, I always wanted to know what's the difference. I hear the Dune book is really good and I hear the movie is a good adaptation. And I'm confused because the movie explained nothing. But... um. Yeah, this video right here, it's, um, you watch it, you take it to heart, and you'll realize how much you can actually do in your life. Um, and it's so satisfying that you, when you take this to heart, you don't actually feel the urge to live any longer than, than the small, simple life that you get, that you're, that you're dealt with, you know, that you get dealt by life. It applies. It's a similar topic, but that one's in my watch list, actually. I haven't watched this one that many times, like how, how you can the other. Oh, even Xerbia made a video on it. My favorite YouTube philosopher, thinker, whatever. Okay. We gotta watch this one. The most common cause of death is called dying, and it kills about... <laughs> Already right off, the, right off the bat. Okay. Let's do this. 
55 million of us each year. That's about one South Africa or 200 Star Destroyers. And good news, it's your turn next because you've just become a competitor in the Suicide Olympics. Bet you didn't even know that was a thing. The rules of the Suicide Olympics are as follows. First place goes to whoever gets themselves killed in the most unlikely or unusual fashion. The winner gets a billion dollars. Now, this isn't like Zimbabwe. Okay, watch this video on your own. I, I don't know, I, I, I do not have time. Here's, here's the video link, got it? This is the link? Watch the video on your own. There, for the sake of time, bro, I wanna get my thoughts out of the way, and then, um, and then maybe I'll show these videos later on. But yeah, there's the link. This video, I remember watching it, and it's basically about how everyone will die. But the, the thing is, is like, People will fear, they'll have fears about what will kill them, and they're stupid, irrational fears. Like, you're not scared about what will actually kill you. Don't be scared of these, like, near harmless things. You know, a lot of times people consider me to be a bad person because I don't feel that much fear or disgust when other people do. I think fear or disgust is what makes people bad people and makes them immoral. And because fear and disgust have become so normalized and so commonplace, um, it, it, it pushes people into this ideology that people who don't feel fear and disgust for the same things that they do are bad people. Like, you know, that's, that's literally why, like, you, you look at uh, Hitler's writings, Hitler did not hate, he, did, he had disgust. Hitler wasn't like, oh, I hate the Jews. He, do, he was disgusted by them. It's like, oh, those guys disgust me. The same way I hear people talk about, oh, uh, it's, it's, it's scary, you know. It's, it's disgusting when you see uh, white people like this, you know, you see like 20 white bald dudes or when you see black people in, in this bad area or whatever. When you see these people talk about this sort of thing, like you have the same mentality of Hitler in that way. You're disgusted. So you don't need to hate, but you, you're, you're fearful or, or you have disgust. You, you want to not be around them. And that, to me, makes somebody a bad person. Hate is, is just another side of the coin of love. But fear and disgust, that encourages nothing but destruction. And now it's like, like people are, are encouraged. Like it's, it's encouraged by society. Like, oh, ew, Android users are disgusting. Why would you have that kind of phone? Like... Even though, for the most part, I think it's harmless, it's still deeply embedded in society, which I don't think is actually all that harmless in the way that people will make assumptions about others and they'll go, oh, others are like this, uh, you know, others are just hateful of other people, when they don't realize that they're the same way. I think that's uh, part, of the, um, part of the reason why people are so miserable, because they're unable to reconcile the fact that on one hand, they a part of their brain is smart enough to know that they shouldn't um just be disgusted at everything and everyone and they should you know not try to cleanse their life of all like make everything so sanitary and sterile and uh you know maybe enjoy life a little eat with your hands a little things like that there's one part of their their brain that recognizes that the you can argue that it's the more masculine part of their brain and there's another part of their brain that uh, ignores that and goes, no, 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 isolate, isolation, isolation. And um, that, uh, that part of their brain is encouraged by the rest of society that has become extremists in this idea. And so um, it's, it's the inability for these people to reconcile, which makes them upset and miserable and causes them to outrage at every little thing they see on Twitter and stuff like that. That's just my theory, though. I don't know why this happened, but sometime over like the past 40 years, it became correct socially um, to act, like morally speaking, if you were afraid of things that you really had no business being afraid of. And, and this sort of thing was never... Um, like the 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 communities that people actually have great respect for that actually make a difference in the world that actually um 
do things that people admire, they all hate the idea of people fear. Like, take for example, rap, okay? You look at the old rap and hip hop community, they loved their community more than they feared the police or uh, government tyranny and things like that. You know, they more than they feared the consequences of, um, you know, ending up on the bad side of the law and things like that. They loved the principles of the game, of the rap game, more than they feared jail time. But you look at rap today. You look at pop. I should say pop. It's not even rap anymore. It's pop. Like, Takashi 6 9 feared jail time more than he feared the, um, the, the core ideas that he, he himself was rapping about, that he was leeching off of. He was talking about how he's, oh, I'm so gang, I'll kill people. I'll do no, you wouldn't. And then yet everyone sees him lie. Like they, they see him deceive them. And they're like, oh, Takashi 6 9 is the goat, bro. He's goaded, he's goaded. Shut the fuck up, bro. People who use the word goaded are dumb as shit. And, and, and you see this all over the place now, good or bad. You can, you can make an argument because a lot of people, like this is a controversial one. A lot of people would disagree with this one. And this is all up to you to decide. I'm just giving you my personal opinion. When COVID hit, if your family member had COVID, you couldn't even visit them in the hospital. Like a, a literal, a derivative of the common cold that on a totally unrelated note will go down in history as a pure example of media-induced mass psychosis nocebo experiment and regulators are going to go, no, 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 we're going to decide for you. You want to live your life? No, we're going to decide. You don't get to hug your family members before they pull the plug on them. And the growing pervasive culture considered this okay. I, I, on the other hand, I love the world and other people and I love living among them more than I fear coronavirus. So like, get me sick. Like, I give a shit. I run the risk of dying, right? Okay, cool. Let's all get sick together. Let's all get past it. Because it's just another part of life. Viruses are a part of life. And yes, people will die. Just like usual. Like, just like always. There is nothing inherently tragic about that. Sad, yes. But it's, it's going to happen. People will die no matter what. The sadness will be there no matter what. It'll be there now or it'll be there tomorrow or it'll be there 50 years from now. Delaying sadness doesn't help anyone. It's pure selfishness, actually. It's selfishness combined with... It's people saying, oh no, I want to protect myself and forget about others combined with lack of self-control and lack of long-term thinking. People who don't think far into the future who don't see the difference, um, who, who think there is a difference between sadness now versus sadness later, they go, I don't want to experience sadness now. Let's put it off until later. And so they decide to feel a little bit less pain now. They put it off. And this selfishness causes people to, to be miserable. It causes the entire society to have to downfall, basically. In, in the and they disguise it they disguise it and they rationalize it in and they lie to themselves by telling themselves they are quote unquote helping others it's not saying that diseases are a part of our lives is an understatement we are diseases deal with it actually there's this tiktok that explains this phenomena from earlier the one that i said where like some people will have less fear and some pe and more love and some people will have more love and less fear. And I remember how I said in the very beginning how like people on the opposite ends of the spectrum will tend to view the other person as evil and that's what's wrong with the world. Here's actually an example of that. Wait, this is just TikTok. Bro, why does TikTok do this? Like, I'm literally on nothing. I'm not logged in, and it's showing, like... Bro, do, do an experiment where you go on, you make a TikTok account, and you just start, and it just shows you softcore porn every time. Look at this. Like, literally, what kind of garbage... I've never used TikTok on uh, Firefox even once for you... Bro. Bro, what? 
Why? Why? What's the point of that? What's the point of doing that? Why? It's gone. The TikTok's gone. I know it's not deleted. It's, it can't be deleted, but I hate how TikTok URLs expire. But in generally, it was this TikTok. Damn, it was so long ago. I, I should save the full full URLs in my bookmark because when I say the full URLs, they don't go away. But it was like this guy who was who was going like he was on this podcast and, and he was talking about something, and it was like something that he wanted to do. And he's like, okay, so eventually I'm gonna die. So blah blah blah. blah. And he uses that as a as a context as a piece of context for what he's actually trying to say. And he keeps going and he's trying to make a point. I think it's something COVID related actually. And um, this girl is like disgusted and she cuts him off and she's like, oh, why would you say that? What's wrong with you? And like, think about that for a second. Like she's so, she's so scared of death that when she encounters someone who isn't scared of death, she has an averse reaction to that. Like she thinks she's feeling sad when people suffer, wrong. That guy's not suffering. She feels sad whenever people she selectively chooses to care about suffer. And when people she doesn't like, that she doesn't uh, relate to, when they win. She's choosing to, she, she's sad when those people are succeeding in life. People die all the time. Are you guys going to cry right now for the 50 people, 50,000 people that died since my stream started? No, then don't act like it. Death isn't negative by itself. It's, it's a part of life. It's part of the cycle of life. It's a part of the game. It's a part of your character development as a human. This is all great, but I said earlier about how um, you, you should think of death in a positive way. You should think of death in a neutral way, and then you should take the jump and think of death in a positive way. Well, here, I'm about to... I'll explain that, okay? Damn, dude, my throat hurts. I need water. Okay. I want to get through all of this, bro. I'm feeling good right now. I'm on a roll. I'm in flow state. So, here, this... um, I, I got another video. This is... This is basically explaining how death solves all your problems. And this one is... It's a bit preachy, like li literally preachy, but I have the full link. That means it didn't disappear. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Watch this, watch this, watch this. I'm prepared to die. In fact, I'm looking forward to it. And when you're prepared to die, you're also prepared to live. Remember when... Uh, Elon Musk said that thing on Twitter uh, about dying and everyone was like freaking out. They were like, oh my God, why would Elon Musk say that? And he was like looking forward to death. He's like, I'm glad, you know, I'm, I'm excited about when the day will come. Not on Twitter. He said in an interview and everyone was like, oh, this is so scary. It's because people can't relate because they themselves are scared. They're the cowards. But he was like, yeah, it'll be a, it'll be a relief the day I die. Look at what this guy says. I'm prepared. I'm looking, fact, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. And when you're prepared to die, you're also prepared to live. It'll help you to live because you don't get panicky with the pressures of life. It's a wonderful thing. It's a great peace. It's a great joy. It's a great security. It's a great assurance. And when I see the people in the world going to pieces and their hollow laughter, trying so desperately to find pleasure, running in this direction and that direction, trying to find peace and failing and the same old emptiness and the boredom and the mystery of life. They don't know where they came from, why they're here, where they're going. So confused and getting more confused all the time. It's a wonderful thing to know, to be sure. And you can be sure and you can know. I'm... The, what he said in the second half is kind of... Uh, rambling i think i personally I, I don't really get much from it it's really preachy like i said but think about what he said in the beginning he's like it's a great security right it's a great assurance people people want safety right but in reality they want the feeling of safety 
That's why TSA exists. TSA literally does nothing. Terrorists get past TSA all the time. TSA just makes people feel safe. They want to feel the safety uh, of uh, not being at risk of being eaten by a bear or being burned in a fire or um, uh, surviving, of not, not being placed in a situation where they're in a, a famine or cold temperatures or drowning or uh, being killed by another person. And you could do what most of these, these cowards do, and you can dwell on this stuff and let your fear consume your life. And you can get all the illusions of security from the world, and, and you can let your tax dollars pay for all this useless garbage. Because that's, that's all it is. It's useless. None of this stuff is actually security. They cannot, none, TSA and all stuff, even the people that, that have results, not like TSA, the people that have results, they still can't control every aspect of their lives, not let alone your life. They can't remove everything that may hurt you. Because if you remove every, every possible thing that can hurt you, you aren't a human anymore. That's how you live forever. You become cancer. But if you make yourself <clears throat> deserving of life in the first place, or you can, oh my God, am I losing my voice? <clears throat> if you can stop caring about, the, about those things that, that you, that'll kill you basically, if you can stop fearing those, then boom, now you're secure, now you're safe from it. Now you have the best security system in the world that can defend you from any kind of imaginable or unimaginable attack for that matter. Because it's not actually security that people want. It's the feeling of security. And if you're not afraid, then you have that feeling of security. And... What do people say in the comments? Yeah, this is all preachy. Jesus and the Lord and God and... Yeah, nah. I like what he said in the beginning, though. It's nice. Do I have another video? I have, I have some more videos. Uh, okay, I'll play them in a sec, but... It's... But he said something else, I think. Prepared to die. In fact, I'm looking forward to it. And when you're prepared to die, you're also prepared to live. That's... Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. That's what I was thinking about. I was wondering, like, I'm missing something. Um, but yeah. When you're prepared to die, you're also prepared to live. That's a really, really great way of looking at it. The reason why I'm showing you guys so much media with this one is because, like, I'm actually not good at explaining this kind of stuff. But there was this interesting, interesting video of this guy um, that I wanted to show you guys. Like, this sort of topic is so, so deeply embedded into people and um, is so untalked about, so taboo, such a taboo subject that it's going to take more than just me to explain it to you. I can explain to you a lot of other things on my own, but something like this is going to take a lot more than just me. So this is something um, that, I, that I, I have in my bookmarks here. And this is actually in a totally different bookmark, but I just remembered it. So this kind of... The obstacles. Um... Basically programs an AI um, to, to play video games. But this little island guy, his name is... Master Higgins, he is so fragile, he dies upon touching almost anything. Um, and he has to wear a helmet when he skateboards, how lame is that, right? And so this game is mostly a go to the right and jump um, and throw hammers at... Naturally, a go to the right game, right? So we train this AI. A... What the... Okay. Alright. So, in this game, there's no spatial gradient, there's no scrolling, there's no going right or up or anything is better. But there are these dots which increase your score. And the score might actually be the only interesting thing that guides the player's progress. And Pac-Man plays very strangely, um, but he is pretty good at avoiding ghosts. And I'm going to fast forward here to my favorite part. Okay, so what would you do in this situation? Like, that? <laughs> I love these trick moves like this. Damn, that's so cool. But I wanted to show you this one, okay? 
Oh boy. So he gives it the controls, and the controls, he basically programs uh, things that incentivize it and decentivize it, gives it the controls, and lets it just do whatever. Um, and that and that way, it, um, it can just sort of figure out the game on its own. So part of the controls of Tetris is is going through the like loading screen as possible. Finally, Tetris. Oh boy, having some trouble with those menus. So this game does not work well at all, and that's not surprising. Uh, playing Tetris well requires some thinking ahead, and this algorithm does not think very far ahead. There it was, pausing the game for no reason. And I think the reason it stacks up the blocks like that, um, which is the worst possible Tetris strategy, is that it gets three points or so when it puts a block on top of another block. So this is really bad, greedy planning. And let's force fast forward a bit to see how this all ends. It's not good. So now it's almost done and pauses the game because as soon as he unpauses, he will lose. And really, the only winning move is not to play. Thank you. Damn, think about that. This AI, it's not so different from, from, see, humans are very robust. We have many, many different minds inside of us is the way I like to look at it. And one of these minds is, is, uncanny to this AI it's it's and every time we make a decision all of these minds are arguing with each other about who should make the decision who should win the, in the decision right what compromise should be made and there's a part of us that's just like this AI the only winning move is to not play and some people look at that as a winning move but in reality that's just a not losing move there's a part of us that's fearful of losing that says, okay, we're so scared of losing, we're not going to play. And so we don't ever bother to try winning. And in that way, when you relate to the fear of death, the only way to survive is to stop living, to stop playing the game, and to enter a state of suspended animation, right? That's the only way to truly live forever, is to stop doing anything. The lazier you are, the less you contribute to entropy. The only way you can truly avoid a car crash is to never drive. It, like if you, if you say, okay, be safe on the road, you can still die in a car crash. The only way to truly avoid it, if it's truly a bad thing, you can't drive. The only way you can truly avoid coronavirus is to never interact with another human being ever again. You can make a, you can make a compromise and you can say, okay, I'll go out and I'll interact and I'll wear a mask. And some people will say, no, you have to self-isolate. And some people will say, yeah, no, you can wear a mask. And some people will say, you don't even need a mask. And all of those people are just basing it off of their own opinions. And what the problem with the world right now is that these people have these opinions and everyone has a spectrum of risk that they're willing to take. Because if you want to avoid coronavirus, there's only one cure, die. That's the only cure. Like, go die if you don't want coronavirus. But if you're willing to compromise and say, you know what? Coronavirus isn't that bad. It's bad, but... Ooh, my timer went off. Um, you could say, like, it's bad, but you know what's worse? Never interacting with another human ever, ever again for the rest of my life. That's worse. I consider that worse. And if you consider that worse, that means coronavirus is a lesser of two evils in that case. And you would risk getting coronavirus so that you can interact with other people. And everybody ha it falls in a different area on the spectrum of this. Um, the most extreme females tend to fall on the very safe spectrum, and the most extreme males tend to fall on the extremely risky uh, part of the spectrum. But generally, there is much, much more overlap, and males and females are typically about the same on this scale. Um, when you look at the averages, when you look at the overall gen pop, so... Everyone has their own different um, opinion on what they themselves should do. The problem with the world is that people are deciding on behalf of others. People are saying, no, you can't go outside. You can't do this. Uh, you, you have to wear a mask. You have to do this. You, we're forcing you to do this. And there's other people who are going, 
no, if you wear a mask, you can't come in here. You, you libtard, you're not allowed in my gym, you're not allowed in my restaurant. Don't wear a mask in here, loser. You let people do what they want. That's the whole idea of live and let live. But, um, do I have another video? I, want, I, I have a ton of videos. Um, I want to play another video while I go do my laundry. Um, let's see, let's see. But yeah, that's 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 what I'm saying about coronavirus. For me, I, I fall on the more risky end of the spectrum. I think people should go out, do whatever the hell they want. Um, if you're scared of coronavirus, then you could do whatever you want. Wear a mask, stay inside, don't go out, don't go to public areas, don't interact with other people. That's the only truly that's the only true way you're going to ever avoid it. I don't really care so much, and I'm not going to tell you what to do. You you shouldn't tell me what to do. That's the way I look at it. But I think for people who understand this and who live and let live, there's another lesson to be learned, which is when you choose how you want to live, understand where you are on that spectrum and understand where on that spectrum heroes are made. No, nothing great ever came from a comfort zone. There has never been a great person in history who said, they, they were asked like, oh, so how did you accomplish this great thing? And they said, well, it all started when I was in my comfort zone. That's never happened, and it never will happen. So it's just something to consider, you know? If you're, if you're very, very uh, scared of taking risks, it's something to consider. Maybe you shouldn't be so scared of taking risks. Maybe, maybe, maybe you should be. You know, there's, we all have these roles for a reason. And we all have this nature within us for a reason. Um, and so maybe you are one of those people that shouldn't be taking risks to keep people in check. But maybe consider the fact that all the great people in history were the ones that did take the risks, that didn't play it safe. And if you want to play the game of life, um, and you want, to, you want to enjoy life to the fullest, maybe you shouldn't be like this AI. It's kind of unsettling to think about how similar it is to a part of our minds telling us what to do. Like, just stay paused forever. If you leave this, this AI here, it will stay paused. It will never unpause. So it doesn't lose. Don't be like the AI. Because once you've accepted that you will lose, that all of us will lose, and that it's inevitable... That's when you're ready to start stacking up some wins before that. And I'll play a video. I'll play a video. Here's a, here's a good one. I literally actually have like a whole playlist of these. I could just share the playlist. Um, when you entered the fifth round against yeah. Kelvin, you said... I'm ready to die. Yeah, well, I looked at him, and I remember, I called it Ese Diablo. He was looking at me, and he just had this, like, look, and he's just swinging his hands. And I said, you're not going to beat me. I'm prepared to die. And I meant that, man. I swear to God, on my life, I meant that. I signed my death warrant right there. I was like, look, if this is how I die, this is how I die. But you see me. Okay, hold up, hold up. I want to talk about this video, but I want to get my um get my laundry real quick, real quick. I'll be right back. I'll be right back.
Okay. Um, yeah. When you dude, this music, these videos are, are like so are like such a big like parody now. Who entered the fifth round against yeah. Kelvin? You said I'm ready to die. Yeah, it was. I looked at him, and I remember I called it Este Diablo. He was looking at me, and he just had this like look, and he's just swinging his hands. And I said, "You're not gonna beat me. I'm prepared to die." And I meant that, man. I swear to God on my life, I meant that. I signed my death warrant right now. I was like, look, if this is how I die, this is how I die. But you see me, I was trying to get him. I was trying to kill him. Because for me, if I'm ready to die, I'm ready to kill. You have to be willing to give something up as well. If he had taken it to me, and he, if he had done that to me, and I didn't wake up, so be it. So be it. So be it. That's it. I mean, at that point, you didn't lose. You, you die, you don't lose. That's someone else's problem. The fight just ended. You just don't lose. But that's, that's how you really win. You prepare to die. You got you to gotta give something up to get another. And if you're prepared to die, then you're prepared to live. And now that I... Now that I give this to the universe, the universe wants to take my life, okay? The universe wants me in the ground. The universe wants to use my nutrition to give to the flora and fauna of the rest of the world, to the rest of nature, right? And if I give them that as a gift, uh, they're going to take it no matter what. But if I offer it to them as a gift, then I've given something and now I get to take another. And I give them... My life, I get a chance to live. It's a law of equivalent exchange. This is how it works. I don't want a funeral, by the way. And my dad taught me, like, as did most people's parents, when something is going to be hard or painful, but you have to do it, you do it now and you get it over with. If you're close to me and you're, you're going to be sad when I die, just grieve my death now. Because... You know, when you'll be sad doesn't change anything. You're going to be sad no matter what. So let's all take a moment of silence for a uh, future of Fraz. Pretend I'll die, okay? Pretend I die. A little moment of silence. All right, cool. Moments pass. Now face that, grieve my death, and be done with it. All right? Don't waste any time. And when I die, don't take out a whole, like, don't... Don't throw away a precious day of your life attending a fucking funeral. And for what? I'm not around to see it. That's, that is not honoring me. I'm telling you right now while I'm alive. You have the... It's, you're, you're being told from the horse's mouth itself. That is not honoring me. That isn't respecting me. You want to really respect my wishes? Firstly, don't spend 12 fucking thousand dollars in a scam industry that takes advantage of people's emotions to... to uh, you know, charge them insane markups uh, because of their grief on like boxes of wood. All right. Fuck that shit. Secondly, forget about all this like sad, like soppy, like let's put the fun back in funeral. All right. If, if you're going to have a funeral for someone's death, my death, I'm not going to speak for others, but for my death, first of all, the people who truly know me, who are truly going to grieve my death, they're not going to grieve it in a fucking day. They're not going to get over it in like a week. So the funeral does nothing. The funeral does not help in any way for these people to grieve. So it's pointless. If, if anything, it's a negative. It is a negative to have a funeral, to hoard the dead. Forget about all this like obligatory sadness. Because every time I went to a funeral, this is why people think I'm a bad person. Every time I went to a funeral, people were like, why don't you ever show any sadness? What, is it? Am I obligated to cry at a funeral if I don't feel like it? If I choose to be happier, if I choose to accept that their death was just a part of their life, and I say, there's nothing tragic here, there's nothing to be sad about, does that make me a bad person? Like, in my case, I'm not going to speak for others, but for my case, when I die... If you want to really honor me, then put the fun back in funeral, all right? Don't bother to do that whole 
uh, you know, twelve thousand, fifteen thousand dollar casket burial, all that garbage. First of all, if you bury someone inside a casket or wrapped up in whatever, they're not actually truly being buried because their their bodies, their nutrition's are not being used as uh, nutrition for the flora and fauna that feed upon it. But even if you were to bury me, don't don't bother doing that either. Don't don't spend the time and and effort and energy and money. Like why do that? If you want to honor me, help yourselves. Don't waste a single second. If you if you really want to do something about my death, if you really want to uh, feel something about it, use it as fuel. Use it as sublimation to make your own lives better. And don't waste a second. Like. Think about it right now, okay? I am going to die. We can all be sure of that. So why don't we just get it over with now? Right? Just grieve my death now and don't bother when it actually comes around. Like, stop. To stop fearing death as well as accept the deaths of those close to you, as well as stop pretending like a death is, neg is a negative thing, you should stop pretending... Like people who you don't know dying is a tragedy. You should stop pretending like you need to feel empathy for all the millions of people out there who die that you have never met. You do this and it'll solve almost every single problem in your life. I saw this clip from this guy who was like, um, it was very similar to that TikTok, but this was a YouTube clip. Um, and he was like, oh, I'm 52 years old, I'm going to die soon. And the guy sitting next to him was like, he wasn't even disgusted the way that the girl was in the TikTok, but he was angry. He was angry at him. He was like, bro, don't say that. What do you mean, don't say that? That's what he, he said that because he felt like saying it. And um, it's just two different reactions to the, to the same sort of sentiment. And it's like these people can't grasp the concept that maybe the way you've been thinking is just conforming like sheep. Maybe this prevailing idea that a longer life is an absolute good, that there's nothing wrong with it at all, and that everyone else should be sacrificed for the sake of longevity, maybe that idea that's ingrained into our heads by society since birth isn't all that's made out to be. I'm going to set another timer. Hold up. So yeah, people are fearful, and fear is the enemy. I don't fear disease, okay? So when people told me I'm a terrible person because I I wanted to travel around in 2020, I saw that coming. They're afraid of disease. And if we aren't afraid of the same things, then we'll see each other as enemies. And the most common fear, the fear of death, is the largest driving force that drives people to be the most extreme when deciding they're enemies. And... It also, it's also what drives people to give up on living a full life. They choose to let go of living a full life just so they can run away from death, even though they're running away from a thing that will absolutely happen. People think that being afraid of dying will give them some sense of urgency in life to do the things that they want to do. It won't. Running away from death is the same thing as, as running away from life. It's not chasing life. Death is a part of life. You can't chase one without chasing the other. You learn to live with it. If you want a sense of urgency, you learn to love life. And loving life also comes with the contingency that you have to love death as well. NASCAR, for example, was the second most watched sport in America at one point. And people died. People died in NASCAR. And they said, no, no, no. We can't have that. Make it more safe. Even though all the NASCAR racers, they hate what it's become. They prefer that sport for people die. But now we have people telling them, no, you don't get to live your life. We decide how you're going to live your life. There's no live and let live going on. It's the majority saying, we're scared that these people are not scared of putting their own lives in danger. So now they put restrictor plates on the cars. Everybody hates it. And now those same people, those same people who wanted to make NASCAR more safe, nobody watches anymore. Those people, it's not that they're afraid of that they're afraid of death. They're just fucking idiots is all they are. 
they know life is boring if you don't if there's no risk of death. They they know that life without death is meaningless. But they they perpetuate this idea over and over and over again because they let this stupid AI remember the AI I was talking about earlier? They let that AI part of their brain, the NPC part of their brain, they let it win. And so they don't actually think. They don't think like a human being. The the one thing that changed NASCAR from the time it was a sports juggernaut to today, where the stands are empty in the biggest uh, biggest stands in the world, the one and only thing that changed was more safety was added. That's it. That's literally all it was. People might think they want more safety, and on the surface they might because there's a stupid part of their brain, the AI part of their brain, that tells them they want more safety and they don't want to lose. But if there's no risk of losing, then winning has no meaning. And a smarter part of their brain, the deeper part of their brain, that actually um, is, is the part of their brain that that's deserves to live, knows this and it goes, well, NASCAR's boring now. And I'm tired of pretending like we should prioritize safety over freedom, like we should prioritize rules over fun, or we should prioritize fear over love. And that guy from that video I was talking about, earlier, um, that clip, the YouTube clip that I saw. In this video, he was like, I'm going to die soon. You know, if everything goes perfectly, I'll live to see 85 and then I'll die. And he's right. And the guy, the guy was like trying to comfort him. He's like, bro, shut up. Your life expectancy goes up every year. And like, think about what he said though. A life expectancy goes up every year. What does it go up one year every year? We're not immortal. We will die. His point still stands. He's trying to make a point. He's trying to make a point that he will die. And in these people's heads, not only do they think that they need to eradicate the inevitable death from their thought process, they can't fathom the idea that someone else is strong enough to not be afraid of what they're afraid of because it makes them feel like they're weak, which they are. So he, he, he tries to comfort him. He's like, bro, life expectancy goes up every year. And he can't comprehend the idea that he doesn't need to be comforted. The, the actual comforting idea is the fact that he will die. Unlike you, he's strong enough, mentally strong enough, to actually come to terms with his death. And that's actually part of the reason why people are so mentally ill. Because they're mentally weak. So illnesses work. And the guy who accepted his death, he's stronger for it. That main guy, he was like, okay, fine, 90, whatever, as if it makes a difference. And then he goes on to say... Uh, the point that he was trying to make, he goes like, he goes like, you know, I'll live to be 90, whatever. He's like, that girl you saw at the coffee shop, just fucking talk to her. And the other guy, the other guy who like automatically assumed that the other guy was afraid of death because he was afraid of death. Naturally, he was hesitant. Of course, right? It's only natural. Of course, someone who's afraid of death is going to be afraid of living too. Death is a part of life. If you're scared of death, you're scared of life. And the second guy was like, Oh, I don't know. I mean, like, maybe you shouldn't. And the main guy was like, why? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? She rejects you? Like, how many times have we heard the phrase, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take? Everyone will die, but not everyone will live. And if you don't chase life and death, you're as good as dead. Every single... Bro... At least half the teachers that I've ever had have had that on the wall. Oh, you miss 100% of the shots you, t you don't take. But nobody I see follows that advice. Almost nobody that I see follows that advice. Like, if you're scared of that girl at the coffee shop rejecting you, bro, she's already rejected you. The rejection is done. You can go up to her and confirm it and change it, maybe. But being afraid of rejection is not the reason to not approach a girl. She's already... It, you can consider yourself rejected from, by default. If you, on the other hand, let love guide your decisions, yeah, you run the risk of being rejected. But if you let fear guide your decisions and you, you go, oh my God, I have the fear of being rejected, you guarantee yourself being rejected because you'll never ask. But if you let love guide your decisions, maybe, maybe you won't be rejected. Maybe. Maybe you'll actually make that shot. It's the same thing with death. As far as the world is concerned, 
you're already dead. If you aren't living a meaningful and fun life, you are pretty much dead. And your death is inevitable. So stop worrying about it. Maybe try living life for once. How do you do this, though? Well, we all know that you shouldn't be afraid of death. Everyone's aware that it's a waste of brain power, right? But how exactly do you accomplish this? I don't know. Actually, I think maybe it just comes with strength. Mental strength, inner strength. Obviously, I can't just like tell you stop being afraid of death and you go like, oh my god, why didn't I think of that? I think... I don't know a solid, clear solution to it. Except for like the vague solution of be becoming stronger. Like the stronger you become, the more the words that I will say to you right now will actually... Um, be, you'll be able to take it to heart easier because you'll have the strength to mentally and physically do that. And um, when I say mentally and physical, mental and physical strength, they aren't disconnected. You should take that into account as well. If you're building strength, mental and physical strength are not, they're not even connected. They're the same thing. After a certain point of you being able to control your surroundings and your, yourself in particular, you realize that there's limits there and limits that you're incapable of crossing and it humbles you. And you have to grieve and sort of accept the fact that some things will forever be out of your control. And I think this is a part of the process of growing up when you're um, chasing being stronger. I think this is also why the anime characters that resonate with young boys the most is the guys who go out seeking as much strength as they can. It's why even though... Um, it's why Netero from Hunter x Hunter is considered a hero, even though he's actually like a villain, basically, in the way that he acts. All he does, He's just a power-hungry, like, monster. I think it's why everyone... Oh, more power levels in Dragon Ball Z. People admire the other people who go out... Well, at least the, you know, men, uh, in a colloquial way, admire the people who go out and seek more power. And I think that's because intrinsically we understand that on this journey of achieving more power, we reach a point where we are humbled. And that, that humbling that we receive from nature or from God or whatever you want to call it, it, I think that is an important step that makes it significantly easier to accept your mortality. So I, that's, it's, it's, it's a thought. It's definitely a thought that I have. And it's not like a foolproof or anything. Um, but I think accepting your death becomes a lot easier if you are strong, physically and mentally. And I think, I know, like, it's very obvious, the science is clear on, like, the stronger you are, the easier it is to accept things, the easier it is to tolerate others, um, the easier it is to understand that it's not worth getting upset over, uh, like, every little thing, like, not sweating the small stuff, you don't dwell on things that you can't control and i think um that aside from all the scientific data backing this from a philosophical perspective if you are if you are strong and you're smart enough to push yourself to be strong you will eventually come to the logical conclusion naturally that death doesn't matter it, it it's something you don't have any control over so why bother worrying about it? Actually, I got one more video. I got I got a playlist of videos and I can share the playlist. There's a few more that I haven't shown, but I'll show one more for right now. What advice would you give to your younger self? Have more confidence. And it's because I didn't that I that I didn't risk things, and that's what you've got to do in life. You just risk everything, and you know there, there is no point living alive if you don't try things. And otherwise, you're just a kind of scared person. If you're watching this, fuck all the bullshit. Fuck your financial situation. Fuck what you got going on with your family, your friends. Fuck everything and everyone. Okay. If forget about the contribution, okay? Forget about my message of what I'm trying to do here, okay? If you take anything from what I'm saying, if you have something you want to do, 
go do that thing. Leave this video. This video is useless. The rest of the stuff I'm going to talk about is other contributions that I've made. It's shit about me. Don't worry about it. Leave this video. Leave. You have something you want to do. Imagine yourself in the shoes of her, okay? Imagine what you'll be like when you're 50, 60, 70. Think about your 70-year-old self. I don't think she's 70. She seems a lot younger. She seems uh, like she knows what she's talking about. She, she may be 70, but youth is a mindset. In her mind, she's a lot younger than that. Imagine yourself in your 70 years, though. 70 years old, though. Your 70-year-old self is fucking jealous of what you are right now. How much energy you have. You can go to the gym and work out. You can change decisions that your your 70-year-old self will will look back at look back and be like, wow, I imagine how different my life would be right now if I had just started going to the gym back then. Imagine how, how different things would be. Like really, I want you to really think deeply about this. Pretend you're 70 years old and look back at all the stuff that you were able to do and be like, man, no knee pain, no back pain, none of, like, I'm, I'm able to like push myself to my limits. I'm able to grow. I'm able to learn all these new things. I'm able to like go out into the world and like actually take some risks. And like, think about what that 70 year old version of yourself would want you to do right now. And what you want to do, that thing that you're thinking about, right? No matter what it is, that goal that you have, chase that goal. If you're doing something that doesn't make you feel like you're chasing that goal, then immediately stop. Immediately stop it and don't do it. And chase that goal. Go do the thing. Do it. Whatever you're thinking about. Do it. Leave this video. And if you feel like coming back to this video later on, um, leave a timestamp in the comments from uh, where you were last watching. And then maybe come back to it and check out the rest of the stuff I have to say.